Hi, welcome back, guys. This is your friend, Parallel Deku, back with another fanfiction. This is the first part of What If Quirkless Deku Became Villain? Now, before starting, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now, let's get into the fanfic. Be at it, twerp, Katsuki shouted as he passed by Izuku Midoriya at the school grounds. Or else I am going to beat your quirkless ass. Izuku stumbled back in fright and covered his face, expecting Katsuki to hit him. As seconds passed nothing happened, and he slightly opened his eyes to reveal that he was the only one left beside the gate. Great, right in the morning I have to deal with this, Izuku muttered. He grabbed his bag around tighter and glanced at the sky with hopelessness. Izuku looked down and saw Katsuki and his group of friends laugh at what he assumed was him. He regained his composure and thought to himself, one day I'll prove to him that I can be a hero too. Izuku once considered Katsuki his friend, a time when both admired the one true hero, All Might, who would save the day without raising a finger. After everyone's quirks developed in childhood and Izuku was left behind, their relationship changed for the worst. Gradually it went from name-calling to segregation, and finally physical abuse. Izuku was a timid boy and was afraid of losing the one friend he ever had. But as time passed, he wished that he would be left alone. The sun continued to rise, gradually hitting Izuku's face. As he made it into the building, he heard the school bell ring. Izuku's eyes rose up as he realized that he was late for class. In the classroom, the teacher stood up beside the chalkboard with an attendance sheet. Okay kids before. Teacher, we're not five years old, interrupted one of the students. He put his feet on the table, challenging the teacher to make a move. Another student was about to speak up before a large thud was made from the classroom door. Everyone turned their heads to see the commotion and saw a panting Izuku that looked like as if he ran an entire marathon. Your late Midoriya, not the best way to start your third year, said the teacher, noting down his tardiness. Uh, I'm sorry teacher I didn't mean to, Izuku said while facing down in order to avoid all the glances his classmates gave him. The teacher looked at Izuku with disapproval and then faced towards the class. There's only one seat left, sit down so we can start class. Izuku quickly nodded and awkwardly shuffled his way in between the desks. He put down his bag and sat down, hoping to be spared of the embarrassment. Apart from him being quirkless, he's also negligent about school. How useless is he? Whispered one of the students, just loud enough for Izuku to hear. Izuku suddenly felt a small impact from the back of his chair. He looked back and saw Katsuki gesture towards him. Izuku swallowed through his throat and wished he would die. Guess we're having fun all year long, Deku, said Katsuki with a grin. That's enough talking all of you, we're already behind schedule, announced the teacher. Now since it's the first day of class I'll forgive your behavior, but remember that this year you will be applying for the high school of your choice. Some of the students cheered. I know that most of you want to become heroes, and some have even proclaimed that they will be applying for UA Academy. The teacher looked towards Katsuki and gave him a small nod. However, there are also those that need to set realistic goals and not apply to UA. Izuku froze. In the summer, he was sent a paper from the school asking him what his future plans were. But he did not assume that the teacher would make it public. He slowly looked around the class and noticed that everyone was looking at him again. Before he could speak up, the entire class erupted in laughter. Him? Midoriya become a hero? asked one girl to his left. She covered her face with pity. He's a quirkless nobody, and he wants to get into UA, said another student. The teacher let the class laugh for a few more seconds, after which he demanded silence. A tiny smirk was still seen from his face. Izuku felt defeated, his legs shook, and tears slowly formed up in his eyes. He gripped his hands, and he felt the death stares that Katsuki was giving him. He knew that he wasn't getting off lightly after school. Afternoon had long passed with the final class bells ringing. Izuku quickly rose up from his chair and made a sprint from the classroom. As he exited the back of the school, he could hear Katsuki shouting behind him. Get back here, Deku, you quirkless little shit. Izuku was terrified, with his only option being to run as fast as his legs could take him. 
He set his sights at the school exit and made a sharp turn, barely dodging Katsuki that used his explosion quirk to speed himself up. W.A., Kaken please think about what you are doing, yelled Izuku. Katsuki ignored his pleas, I don't give a shit, and I'm going to break your nose for calling me that. Izuku continued to run for his life, but his body could not keep up any longer. He turned his head to look at the distance between them, only to see Katsuki land a kick on his face. The blow caused Izuku to tumble several feet before hitting a concrete wall in a park playground. Izuku's vision was blurry from the blood dripping down his forehead. He began to breathe heavily and felt a sharp pain in his chest. His voice left him, unable to scream for help as he could see Katsuki gradually approach him. Goddamn bastard, thinking you'd get away from me, Katsuki said with an annoyed look. There's no one around here to save you, Deku, and I swear I'll make it painful. He cracked his knuckles while facing down towards Izuku. Stop. Kaken, I, I'm sorry, cried out Izuku. He wanted it to be over, he could no longer tolerate the pain and misery he had to face every day. Katsuki swung a large kick into Izuku's stomach. Huh? he asked. I thought I told you already not to call me that. Izuku gasped for air. He grabbed his stomach in pain, and his head fell onto the ground. Katsuki knelt and grabbed Izuku's green hair, slowly bringing up his face to his own. You want to get into UA? he asked with a serious tone. I thought I made it clear that I will be the first and only person from this school to get in there. Are you trying to make fun of me? Izuku felt cold. Shivering in fear, he was not able to answer him. Izuku's face had swelled up from the initial kick Katsuki gave him. He could no longer feel his body move, yet everything hurt. Answer me, are you stupid? Katsuki shouted. He looked at his former friend and removed his grip. Katsuki turned to his left and saw a notebook protruding out of Izuku's backpack. For a moment he felt that he went too far until he saw its title. He grabbed the book and scanned through the first few pages. What the hell is this? Katsuki said. You must be kidding me. Izuku barely understood what Katsuki meant. He was not able to see or hear properly. He attempted to get up, but his arms failed to move. No matter how hard he tried, his strength failed him. I really am useless, aren't I, Izuku thought, just because I have no quirk. Hero analysis for the future, Katsuki read. You think a quirkless reject like you can compete with anyone? Izuku remained on the ground. He was afraid, afraid that he would die. Wake up, Deku, it's no time to be asleep, said Katsuki. He picked up Izuku once more and began to lightly tap his face. Izuku woke up from his daze and screamed at the sight of Katsuki. He crawled back up against the wall where he was first thrown at. Geez, said Katsuki as he cleared his ear with his finger. Finally back to your senses. Izuku saw Katsuki get closer from the corner of his eye. The day had grown darker with the sun slowly moving down. He could hear once again the branches that stirred gently in the wind, scratching at one another. Izuku opened his mouth to plead with Katsuki one last time, and the words seemed to freeze in his throat. He looked at the notebook that Katsuki held, the one and only medium for where he felt he could express his ideas and love for the hero world. Katsuki noticed Izuku's sight, and a large grin formed on his face. That gives me a great idea, Deku. Katsuki pointed to the notebook. For a quirkless piece of shit like you, this thing is useless. Give it back, Izuku shouted, finally being able to speak. He attempted to grab it, but Katsuki was quicker on the draw. You wish, said Katsuki. He stood up and placed the notebook between his hands. Rather, I think it deserves something better. Izuku's eyes widened in horror as he witnessed Katsuki explode it. Small pieces of burnt paper fell to the ground, leaving almost nothing recognizable. They're much better, Katsuki said. He stomped on the remaining pieces that were still burning. Izuku could no longer hold it in. The anger that dwelled inside him had risen to the point where it overtook all of his emotions. He yelled and attempted to swing at Katsuki several times with his fist, missing completely. That's the spirit, but who said you can hit me? Katsuki asked mockingly. Before Izuku could respond, Katsuki placed his hand over his face and caused a small explosion. Just a little goodbye present for you, 
Katsuki sneered as he lifted his hand. The blast caused Izuku to lose consciousness, his lifeless body lay on the ground. Izuku began to hear a deafening sound that grew louder and louder. Where am I, he thought. His vision was black, and as time passed, he slowly began to see again. The sound he heard earlier was rain pouring down on him as he lay in the playground. He looked at the cloud-filled sky, he wasn't sure if the tears that passed down his cheeks were from him. Why even bother trying to become a hero? Izuku asked to himself as he clutched his chest. What did I do to deserve this? Izuku tried to stand up several times, hitting the wet muddy ground. Work legs, damn it work, Izuku shouted in grief. He punched his legs several times before giving up and shifting his head downward. His belongings lay beside him, destroyed either from Katsuki or the rain. Izuku began to laugh slightly, placing his hands on his face. The mix of emotions confused him, it reminded him of the time when he first learned as a kid that he would never get a quirk. Seconds passed as Izuku calmed down, he pulled away from his hands and noticed that there was blood. He quickly reached over to his backpack and removed a cloth to dry his face. He attempted once again to stand up, this time successful. I got to get back home, mom must be worried sick by now, muttered Izuku underneath his breath. His knees shook as he bent down to grab his bag. Izuku completely ignored how beat up he was. What time is it? Izuku looked over at his watch with slanted eyes. It read 10.37 p.m. Mom is definitely going to kill me, Izuku thought. How am I going to explain this? Izuku stumbled across the playground. He made his way across the street, hoping no one would see him in his state. He grabbed the wall across him making sure that he did not fall again. His head was still dizzy from earlier, he felt as if time slowed down drastically. What do we have here? asked a voice. People like you shouldn't be walking outside at this time. Izuku turned to the direction of the voice, but was unable to discern who it was. A little on the slow side, the figure stepped towards Izuku. Well, that doesn't matter to me anyways. Izuku looked up once more. The figure was indiscernible, and he could not make out its features. Before he could ask any questions, the shadow was gone. Izuku jumped out of fear until a hand appeared on his shoulder. What's wrong, young man? You shouldn't be walking around this late at night, said a familiar voice. I know, Izuku said. He stood up carefully while still in shock from what happened. Are you injured? Are you okay? asked the man. Yeah, I tripped earlier and hit my face pretty hard. Izuku lied as he turned around. In front of him stood the man he admired since as early as he could remember, All Might, the hero of heroes. Izuku's mouth opened wide, and the fan inside of him took over. Oh my god, All Might, is that really you? Holy, eh, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you, Izuku said, while shaking his hands up and down. All Might looked flustered. Oh, you are a fan of me, he asked. Holy cow, yes. I watched all of your specials and got all the special edition mini figurines, Izuku exclaimed with excitement. He never expected All Might to show up out of nowhere, and at the time when he needed him the most. Well it's great to hear that you are okay young man, All Might said. In that case I must head off, patrolling the streets and all that. Make sure to get home quickly. Before he could take off, he was interrupted by an unexpected shout. All Might, Izuku faced towards him. He knew he would never get to ask if he didn't do it now. Even if I don't have a quirk, can I become a hero? His feet trembled with nervousness. Can even someone without a quirk be like you? All Might looked at the boy. Heroes are always risking their lives for others. I cannot simply say that you can become a hero even without a quirk. I, I see. Izuku stared at All Might, he could barely let out a voice. If you want to help others, then you could become a police officer, All Might said calmly. Regardless of how others view them, it's still a respectable occupation. It's not bad to dream, but you also have to consider what is realistic. All Might leapt into the air, leaving him alone in the street. Izuku continued to face the direction his hero stood a few moments ago. Unable to understand the conversation he had, Izuku faced back and walked home slowly. In the Midoriya household, the main entrance creaked open. Inko Midoriya rushed over and greeted her son. 
It's almost midnight, I've been worried sick, Inko said. She followed her disoriented son through the hallway. Where have you been, Izuku, and what are these bruises? I um, kind of fell down when I was walking home, and some elderly couple insisted, I go to the hospital, Izuku said, while shifting his eyes away from his mother. Inko was worried he was lying to run away from his problems, but she was glad to see him safe. Then why did the hospital not call me? Izuku stared at the floor. They said it wasn't anything serious, so they let me go after doing some checkups. Well, all right then, but make sure to be careful, Izuku. You know I love you, so talk to me if anything is on your mind. Inko said with a warm look. I see your backpack got ruined from the weather, I'll go ahead and wash it for you. Go get some rest. Sure thing, Mom Knight, Izuku said. Izuku closed the door to his room and sat on his bed. His body hurt, and it was difficult for him to move even then. He looked at all the All Might merchandise that was spread across his room. It finally dawned upon him what he went through that day. Why do I exist? Izuku asked himself. No one believes in me, not my mom, not Kaken, and not even all of them, Izuku broke down. He couldn't stop the tears streaming down his face as he collapsed and started crying hysterically. Izuku opened his eyes. The morning sun rays had pierced through the window in the room, crossing his face. Izuku turned to the left, blocking the sun with his back. He had cried all night from what transpired the day before, scared to relive those memories again. Izuku stayed motionless, staring at the wall in front of him. A large poster of All Might towered over, presenting the hero in all his glory. In the past Izuku would squeal from excitement every time he saw it, but now it reminded him of the face that told him his dream was not achievable. Izuku raised his arm to remove the poster. Before he could do it, he was interrupted by a knock on his door. Izuku dear, it's time to get ready for school, Inko said through the door. I've made your favorite dish, so don't take too long or it'll get cold. In his room, Izuku did not move. He lowered his right arm as he looked at the poster with a blank stare. Izuku, is everything all right? He exited his trance, realizing his mother called for him. Yeah, I'm coming, Izuku responded with a dejected voice. Inko stood by the door, not certain what to do. She wanted to comfort him. Over time their once and happy relationship degraded into isolation from one another. Even then, she could not stand by him when he needed her the most. Inko looked at the door for a few more seconds, before deciding to go back into the living room. The light had begun to cover Izuku's room. He stood up from his bed and closed the window blinds. His body was still sore from the beatings Katsuki gave him. Izuku walked over to his mirror to see large bags under his eyes. He was not able to sleep the entire night. Izuku moved towards his door and opened it slowly. The school bag that his mother washed lay still on the hardwood floor. Izuku picked it up and headed towards the front door. Wait Izuku, I thought you were going to have breakfast, Inko said. Izuku continued putting on his shoes. I'm not hungry mom, I'll just get something at school later, Izuku replied. Before Inko could respond back, he closed the door and left. The wind had pushed cherry blossom petals around the school, covering the ground with a pleasant color. By the school gates, Katsuki and his friends stood by waiting. Izuku continued walking forward, disregarding the obvious trap that had been set up. Hey Deku, Katsuki said irritatingly, where do you think you're going? Izuku kept walking. He faced the school, not realizing Katsuki was addressing him. You really messed him up, didn't you, huh? asked one boy in his group. Or is he just not afraid of you anymore? Katsuki flashed in anger and raised his fist. Listen to me when I am talking to you quirkless nobody, he shouted, moving forward and landing a punch in the back of Izuku's head. The punch was strong enough to make Izuku fall. He lay on the hard-covered dirt, before slowly getting up and continuing to walk ahead, unfazed from what happened. Katsuki looked at Izuku, bewildered from what he had just witnessed. This only angered him more. That goddamn Deku thinks he's better than me, Katsuki challenged. He let out some small explosions from his palms before he was stopped by one of his friends. Hey Katsuki, be careful, one of the teachers might see us, he said. Just get him later when no one else is around. Katsuki continued to stare at Izuku. 
He deactivated his quirk and scoffed at what transpired. I'll meet you guys up ahead in class, I've got to tell him something. His voice was hoarse with unwarranted fury. He deserves what's coming for him. Katsuki walked over to the boy he had just hit. He placed his arm around Izuku's shoulder and leaned over. When lunch break hits, meet me outside class, Katsuki said, and don't you dare and try to run away from me. Katsuki let go of his grip, tapping his hand against Izuku's head as he headed towards class. Katsuki's friends from earlier ran past Izuku, also hitting his head one by one. While Izuku had been walking, his mind strafed all over the place. He did not care about where he was, and who did what to him. His dreams of becoming a hero were shattered, and the boy that bullied him would get everything he ever wanted. Izuku entered the classroom, passing through the back and sitting down on his chair. He looked at the window, a glass building was seen in the distance with a large logo displaying Yua. Look guys, he's staring at Yue again, pointed out a classmate that was standing beside Izuku. Everyone laughed, with a few students that threw slander at him. Quirkless freak was an insult Izuku heard often. A day ago, he would have been crying over it, but now he paid no attention to them. His mind would not listen, even if he wanted to. The classroom door closed as the homeroom teacher entered. The entire room quieted down, and the students went to their seats. The school bells rang immediately after. Midoriya, hello Midoriya? Izuku looked up and saw the teacher facing him, waving his hand across his face. It's already lunchtime, go get something to eat, he said. Izuku stood up casually and turned towards the door. Oh, and Midoriya, if I catch you staring at ponies in the sky again during class, I'll give you detention. Izuku nodded and closed the door behind him. To his surprise, Katsuki was slanted against the wall with his arms crossed, tapping his fingers furiously. It took you long enough, Deku. Are you fucking deaf or something? Katsuki asked. I was going to beat your ass after the teacher left, but you got lucky. Izuku looked at Katsuki. He wondered what his bully would do to him next. Perhaps he'll break my arm this time, or I don't know something else, Izuku wondered to himself. Thoughts that would have scared him to death seemed to go through his mind nonchalantly. Did you forget what I told you this morning? Katsuki asked with an annoyed look. Izuku did not answer. Katsuki looked at him again. The way Izuku acted with disinterest pissed him off beyond measure. Katsuki bit his lip and pointed to the stairs leading upwards. Follow me Deku, we need to talk. Both walked up the stairs, with Izuku trailing behind Katsuki. Izuku did not know what Katsuki wanted, only that it was pointless to run. Katsuki took out a set of keys from his pocket as they reached the final floor. He grabbed the handle of the door and opened it with a key, revealing an open area on the school roof. A large gust of wind passed through them, which caused Izuku's hair to point up. Go through the door, Katsuki ordered. Izuku reluctantly walked through and looked at the bright blue sky. Katsuki closed the door behind him, leaving the keys inside. Do you know why I called you here, Deku? Katsuki asked with a large grin. Izuku looked back down towards Katsuki. The two made eye contact with each other. If I were to guess, it's nothing that benefits me, Izuku said. Oh, it benefits you all right. Katsuki responded back laughing. He pointed towards Izuku. Perhaps I haven't made it clear to you that you're useless. You're a nobody, and I don't like the way you've been acting since this morning. Was that everything you wanted to say? Izuku asked, putting his hands inside his pockets. The wind caused the air to feel much colder than it was. Is this where you go and beat me up because I'm different? Izuku was about to say something else, until Katsuki ran up towards him and kicked Izuku's side. Izuku stumbled back, catching himself by landing his arms on the concrete floor. The kick hit Izuku's ribs, the pain caused him to cough and gasp for air several times. So what? Katsuki asked. He walked up to the injured boy and placed his foot on top of him. Katsuki then pushed him, which caused Izuku to collapse on the ground. Stop trying to act like a smart-ass Deku. I'm quite frankly fed up with how you're acting now. Did you stop and think about how that makes me look in front of others? Izuku groaned in pain. He clenched his side as Katsuki began to walk over to him. 
I'm getting tired of this, whispered Izuku to himself. Speak up you quirkless fuck, Katsuki shouted. He landed another kick, this time on the head. For a moment Izuku was filled with a terrible and loud ringing noise. No matter how hard he tried to get rid of it, it came back in intervals. Izuku tried to cover his ears, but it did not help. Katsuki's eyes lit up. He finally saw Izuku react to pain as he did in the past. There we go, now that wasn't so hard was it? Katsuki bent his knees down, he took pleasure in looking at Izuku suffer. Remember when I said us being here would benefit you, Katsuki said. I truly meant it. He picked up Izuku by the collar, and faced him towards a small rail that looped around the edges of the school roof. You see that horizon? That's your way out, maybe then you'll be born with a quirk. Katsuki continued gripping Izuku tightly. Now go on then do it. No one will care. Izuku looked at Katsuki through the top of his eyes. He once again felt despair, but his mind had left him. Izuku started thrashing in terror, speaking incoherent sentences as tears streamed down his face. Katsuki looked at him. If you're not going to do it, then I'll help you. Katsuki overpowered Izuku with physical strength alone, and began moving him closer to the ledge. They'll think it's just suicide, a poor miserable kid who killed himself because he had no quirk. The wind had grown stronger and muffled any sounds that were heard from above. Katsuki continued to drag Izuku closer, he laughed to himself. Think of it as me helping you Deku, I am only making it easier for you, Katsuki said. Don't lie to yourself, you know you want to do it. Izuku did not attempt to break free, the amount of psychological and physical stress had led him into a state of extreme madness. Suddenly, his mind went clear and a shadow appeared in front of him, sitting on the edge of the roof. It looked out towards the city. Has it finally gotten to the grand finale? The shadow contemplated. You know I wonder sometimes how you dealt with this, but now I see that you are weak. Time had slowed down once again. Izuku looked at the shadow once more, its features were incomplete, yet oddly resembled a human. You have a few seconds left before your fate is sealed. Once you fall of this roof, plunging to your death people will scream in horror. But when they learn it was you, you will only become a joke, an afterthought to them. What are, Izuku paused, are you God? Far from it, yet I am surprised you haven't recognized me, the figure answered in a flat voice, it turned around to face Izuku. I am the manifestation of your hatred, I am you. Izuku could see a faint smile. You've just kept me hidden away, ignoring that I exist. And now here I am, offering you a way to survive, the shadow said with a caring tone. Help me, Izuku pleaded without a second thought. He began to cry once more, whether it was out of fear or not. It was the first time anyone truly extended him a welcoming hand. He accepted reality. Good, I am glad you have chosen me, said the shadow. Parts of its body and face started to shape into Izuku's image. It gave off a large smile, but it did not feel warm. Katsuki picked up Izuku and placed his chest on top of the rail. He noticed Izuku's body slump forward without any resistance. Did he pass out? Katsuki thought. Katsuki felt something odd occur, before he realized what happened, his head was grabbed and smashed across the guard rail. Katsuki stumbled back, regaining his footing. Oh that fucking hurt, Katsuki shouted. He shook his head around to find out who did it. Who the hell was it? Show yourself. Katsuki froze when he saw Izuku standing in front of him. Who do you think it was Kaken? Something wrong with your head now, Izuku asked, pointing his finger at his own. What the F, Katsuki said before he was interrupted. Let me finish, I've sort of grown impatient letting you speak all the time, Izuku pointed out. Katsuki could not move, Izuku's actions confused him. Is that really the Deku I know, Katsuki thought? This is hilarious, just look at your face, Izuku said with a smile. He brought his body forward, tilting his head to the side. I know what you're thinking. And yes, it's still me, but I can thank you for finally driving me to this point. It feels refreshing. Katsuki clenched his fists, deep down there was a small part of him that was afraid. But it was still the Deku he knew that was standing in front of him. So you finally went nuts, Katsuki taunted Izuku. 
gives me a better excuse to beat the shit out of you. In the distance, the school bell rang. Katsuki put his fist up and charged towards Izuku. He swung his right arm at head level. Izuku quickly ducked. He felt Katsuki's hand pass through his hair. Izuku attempted to laugh at his attempt, but was quickly hit in the stomach from a left jab. Katsuki walked towards Izuku, but was instantly grabbed around his torso. The fight turned into a grappling match, with both sides hitting each other with whatever arm or leg they could use. Get off me damn it, Katsuki said. He punched Izuku in the back several times before his legs slipped and both fell. Before Katsuki realized what happened, he looked up and saw Izuku holding his hand. His body lay swinging on the side of the school building. Izuku attempted to hold on as hard as he could. He did not know why, but his body moved on its own. Is this what you wanted, Deku? Katsuki asked with a slight crack in his voice. Tell me. Izuku ignored Katsuki. He tried his best to hold on using all the strength he had left. The commotion was seen from below, with a gym teacher, and a few students seeing a student being held with one hand. Katsuki began to form tears in his eyes. He did not want to die. Deku, Katsuki cried out. Izuku tried to reassure Katsuki he would be safe, but at that moment he felt his grip slip. Izuku watched in silence as Katsuki fell, his back faced the ground as he looked into Izuku's eyes. Screams were heard across the entire school, as most classes peered out of the windows to see where the sounds were coming from earlier. All they saw was a student's body laying on the ground lifeless. Izuku moved back from the ledge and stared blankly at what he had witnessed. He did not want Katsuki to die, but deep in his mind, he felt as if he was relieved from a pain in his heart. Izuku touched his face and felt that his lips had arched up slightly. There was no fear, no pain, no feeling of guilt, only laughter. Izuku sat in a small room still wearing his school uniform. He waited for what seemed an eternity. Izuku looked at the desk in front of him. A cup of freshly made coffee had gotten cold. The door to the room opened. All right, Midoriya, I apologize for making you wait, said the police officer. He sat down across the table from Izuku. I'm Detective Nayamasa Tsukachi. I'm leading the investigation for Bakugo's death. The detective glanced at the untouched mug. Don't like coffee? he asked. Oh no, um, not really, Izuku responded. He could not stand bitter drinks. Namasa leaned back against his chair and pointed towards the door. Well, in that case, do you want me to get something else for you? Namasa asked. We've got tea and most likely some other drinks. I'm good, thanks, Izuku said. He shifted his eyes down to the ground. Namasa stared at him for a moment. He placed document files on the desk. I'll be frank with you, Midoriya. I'm only here to get information on what happened and were riding on the fact that it was an accident, Nayamasa said. He opened the folder, showing a picture of Katsuki. You were the only one on the roof when Bakugo fell. Izuku stared at the picture silently. We are aware of your history with the boy. It wasn't that hard to figure out from the people who were around you daily, Nayamasa said. But why were you both there? Izuku told him what transpired. He explained the details of Katsuki bullying him and leading up to the point when they went up to the roof. You're telling me that after he brought you up, it ultimately resulted in him tripping and falling off the ledge, Nayamasa said, he rested a finger on his chin. Izuku nodded, even though it was his actions at the end that led up to that moment, it was the truth. Inside his mind, Izuku laughed to himself and questioned at how it even happened. Was there anything else? Nayamasa asked. He shifted through another paper, writing down information. Izuku noticed it was his chance to make the detective feel more sympathetic to him. Before he fell, he brought me up there to commit suicide. Nayamasa's eyes moved up from his glasses. Interesting, if that's the case, I'm sorry you had to experience that. He attempted to see if Izuku's body movement or speaking behaviors changed. He was unsettled at how a junior high boy seemed unfazed from the events that transpired, and how normal he acted after mentioning he was almost killed. 
Naomasa copied Izuku's sitting position, he brought his legs closer together. With everything that happened, why do you appear so calm? Izuku took a moment to reflect on the question, he did not want to say anything that would make him suspicious. I don't know sir, it's just that I've never really been close to him after his quirk developed. He paused. And I'm just trying to forget about what happened. Naomasa could not fault the boy. He was aware of the negative perception people with no quirks got, let alone how children would view that and prey on those who were different. In reality, Izuku never wanted to forget the moment when Katsuki fell. He could not get enough of the face he last saw before his bully died. Izuku wanted to see it again, he did not understand why, but it felt good. Naomasa was about to ask another question before a speaker in the room interrupted him. A woman's voice spoke through. Detective Tsukachi, the final piece of evidence you requested earlier had just arrived. You can go ahead and pick it up. Naomasa raised his forehead a little, he placed his mug down. We'll take a break for a bit, I'll be back in a few minutes Midoriya, sorry about that. Izuku wasn't sure what they meant by evidence, but he did not remember at any point where his actions would be seen as guilty of murder. He glanced over the room, one thing caught his attention. Izuku noticed it was the only other object in the room apart from the table. A large vase of flowers stood in a corner, it portrayed an assortment of visible colors, yet something did not belong there. Better keep my mouth shut, and not say something I'll regret, Izuku thought. He was not certain if a recorder was placed there, but it was better to be safe than sorry. Thirty minutes had passed, yet the detective did not return. Izuku bored out of his mind, counted the number of visible dots he saw on the drywall ceiling. 1T132, 1T133, 1T134, Izuku counted. The door opened right before Izuku could continue. Sorry about the wait, Mayamasa said. Izuku noticed that he did not bring his folder with him. The good news I can tell you is that you've been completely exonerated from any sort of suspicion. Izuku sat in disbelief. Did it really take that fast, he thought? If you're wondering why, we reviewed video footage from a security camera that was stationed up at the roof. I guess it was there for a good reason, Naomasa stated. When he reviewed the footage, Izuku's story aligned with what was shown. Along with all of the witness accounts being factored in, everything comes together, so I'm sorry for putting you through all of this, Naomasa said. He sat back down on his chair. Granted that this was proper procedure, he retorted. If you were the one responsible for his death, then it would spell out a different story. Izuku looked down, it was difficult for him to keep a straight face. Oh, I didn't mean to mention that, Naomasa laughed, he misunderstood Izuku for being scared. With that out of the way, unavoidably, there is also some bad news Midoriya. The boy looked at Naomasa, confused from what he meant. Due to the incident that occurred a few days ago, we felt as if it was in the best interest to transfer you to another school. Some of them in this region take third-year transfer students in, Naomasa said. He stopped to regain his breath. But due to the situation, they're not willing to take you in. I hope you understand. Izuku looked at the detective, twiddling his thumbs. He did not care about school anymore. The school you're in right now can't legally expel you. So there are no other real options for you, Naomasa said quietly. He stood up from his chair and gestured Izuku to do the same. The detective put one hand on Izuku's shoulder. Your mom is waiting outside. Izuku, Inko cried out, she ran towards her son and hugged him with tremendous force. Mom, you're hurting me, Izuku whispered. He attempted to get out, but she did not let go. I was so worried, I thought you were hurt, and they did not let me see you. She looked at the detective with an angry look. Naomasa put his hands up, feigning ignorance. Pretty sure that is illegal to do with a minor, Izuku thought for a second, but he was just glad to have gotten out. Did they do anything to you? Inko asked. She let go of her son, wiping her tears away. Izuku looked at her. No mom, everything's fine. The detective smiled at the sight. I don't mean to interrupt your reunion, but there's still something I need to mention. Naomasa said, he put his hands inside his coat pockets. Inko and Izuku faced towards him. 
We've done our best to keep the details surrounding this tragedy away from the news outlets, Mayamasa said. He passed Inko over his business card. If they start bothering you and your son, give me a call and the department will sort it out. He opened the door and left the building. Inko placed the card inside her purse, as they exited the police department, she let out a sigh. Izuku, I was hoping we could visit Bakugo's family and give them some proper closure. Izuku did not like hearing that. I don't think they'd like to see me, and if anything, isn't that the police's job? Izuku murmured an excuse. Don't be like that, Inko replied in shock. Mitsuki and Masaru always liked you when you were younger, and it would be better if you explained to them what happened. Tell them that he was a good friend. Izuku's eyes lit up in anger. What about how I feel, Izuku shouted, surprising Inko. Several passers-by stopped and faced towards the outcry in the street. Do you even know who he was to me? Why should I do something like that for him? Izuku berated his mother, he clenched his fists. Have you ever stopped to consider my well-being over others for at least one day? It was the first time Inko witnessed her son act that way. His words left her stunned, and before she could respond, Izuku ran off. Izuku wait, Inko cried out. Izuku continued to run as fast as he could. He wanted to be left alone. Just anywhere but here, Izuku reasoned to himself. The sun had already begun to set. Izuku continued running aimlessly forward, confusing pedestrians as he passed them. His body grew tired, but Izuku mustered on until the point of fatigue. Izuku had lost sense of time and direction. The only thing that faced in front of him was the ocean, glimmering in a red pastel color. Seagulls flew over as they attempted to catch fish swimming in the water. You're just overreacting, a voice said behind Izuku. That's not who I am. That's not who we are. The embodiment of Izuku's natural desires reappeared in front of him. Only its face mirrored his look, the rest was covered in shadows once again. Just look at you. Even after you took care of Katsuki, you're conflicted, the shadow said. Make up your mind. You shouldn't care about how others feel about you. Mother might have made it look like she cared, but she was the first one to throw you under the bus. She's not your mother, Izuku countered immediately. The shadow looked at Izuku with disappointment. I thought we have already gone over this, it said. I understand how you feel, but this is getting us nowhere. Izuku blinked, staring at the shadow. Then what do you propose I do? The shadow snorted. Must I repeat everything again? Whatever. The shadow stopped, it spoke in a chilling tone. Stop caring about others and also how they feel about you. First rule and the last rule, it said. I don't expect change immediately, but there is already some progress. Yeah, well, that's because I was led up against a wall, I had no choice, Izuku said. But it felt good when you did it, I know it felt good, the shadow replied back. Izuku could not argue with it, there was some truth to that emotion. When Katsuki fell, Izuku felt relieved. I don't plan on coming back out again, the shadow said, it looked at Izuku with dead eyes. I'm not here for emotional support. If you intend on paying back the world that had left you to die, it's only your actions that will prove it. You're right, Izuku responded with an expressionless face, he realized what a child he had been. In front of Izuku stood the only thing that truly understood him. Izuku looked back towards the shadow, but it was already gone. Inside the house Inko paced back and forth, worrying about her son. She initially wanted to head back to the police office and have them find Izuku, but she soon realized they would not do anything if he had been missing for one hour. I just hope he's okay, she thought to herself. Maybe I did push him too far. She grabbed the house phone, dialing 911. She looked at the screen displaying the number before canceling it and placing it back down on the stand. Inko did not know what to do. The front door's handle suddenly moved. The door opened, revealing Izuku standing beside it. Izuku, you're back, Inko asked, still not believing what she had seen. Izuku nodded, he entered inside and closed the door. Just had to take a breather, I am fine now. Izuku said. Look, dear, I'm sorry about earlier, Inko admitted. I didn't consider your thoughts about it. It's fine, Izuku responded. 
he took off his shoes and walked past Inko into the hallway. Maybe his mother cared for him, he thought, but it was too late. Inko turned to face Izuku. If you're hungry, I can make some dinner. Izuku waved back. Sure, I'll be in my room. Call me when it's ready, he said with a flat voice. Inko was not sure how to respond to what she had witnessed. She did not know whether to be happy that her son came back or feel frightened by the way he acted. Izuku closed his door and removed his school vest, following up with his dress shirt. He walked up to the mirror and looked at himself. From across the shoulders to his hips, his body was covered in scars and burns that he had accumulated from injuries Katsuki had given him since childhood. It did not bother Izuku anymore, he intended on wearing it like armor. A reminder to himself of who he was and what had been done to him. Izuku chuckled when he remembered how hard he always tried to hide it from his mother. Even now he was certain she did not know. He looked at the desk in front of him, a large pile of notebooks he had written down lay untouched. Regardless of what its intentions were, I guess it could still prove useful to me, Izuku said to himself. He opened the notebook at the top and looked through its contents. Top hero quirks and how they can be improved, he read. Izuku flipped to the next page and saw a drawing of All Might. Quirk. Super strength and awesomeness. How to improve it. Izuku stared at the page before he let out a small laugh. Even though All Might told him he could not be a hero, Izuku respected his sense of duty and actual effort into saving others instead of himself. I guess I am going to have to do more research, Izuku said. He closed the notebook and walked up to the closet, grabbing a long sleeve shirt and putting it on. There is still a lot of more interesting quirks for me to learn about, Izuku thought, before sitting down on his bed. He was not certain of how he would enact revenge against the society that wronged him. Izuku pondered for a while, he then came to a short-term solution. Izuku rested his chin on his hand. All I have is information about hero quirks and some villains, but I need more if I want to get somewhere with this. Izuku did not know where to start yet it did not matter to him. Just the thought alone of him doing something terrible made his heart tremble with excitement. He had not felt that way since Katsuki's death. Izuku dinner is ready, Inko yelled, loud enough for him to hear. Izuku stood up and left his room, he walked over to the dinner table and sat down. Inko shifted over with two plates and placed one beside him. She noticed that Izuku acted happier than how he was earlier. Well someone looks better now, Inko said joyfully. Just make sure school doesn't bring you down. Oh it won't, Izuku said immediately. Inko was surprised once more, she could not tell what her son was thinking. He seemed like a completely different person. Izuku took a bite out of his fish. I'll be home later tomorrow. Oh, why is that? Inko asked with curiosity. I'm planning on doing some research for an assignment that's coming up, Izuku replied, grinning towards his mother. Izuku cussed outside of his apartment. The morning breeze had set in, pushing small scraps of paper beneath his feet. Izuku rubbed his eyes, he had trouble sleeping the night before. Initially, it was from his excitement but whenever he tried to close his eyes after, his body would not go to sleep. Izuku walked down the building stairs. If I'm going to do this, I'll need to find an opportunity where I get to meet a villain in private, Izuku thought. He knew his plan was reliant mostly on luck. Finding someone trustworthy was going to be difficult. School comes first though for now, Izuku muttered. He held a brand new notebook in his hands. The atmosphere changed at the junior high school ever since the incident. Katsuki was beloved by everyone due to his exceptional talents, they were sad to have him gone. All of the students stopped and whispered when they saw Izuku, keeping their distance from him. Izuku was annoyed at how much attention he received. A group of first years stared at him, to which they only saw eyes of pure hatred, which seemed to penetrate into their souls. They quickly ran off, passing by him. Izuku walked over to his classroom, his classmates quieted down immediately. He sat down once again at the chair he was given at the start of the year, this time no one was going to kick him in the back. One of the students finally made the courage to speak up against Izuku. It should have been you. The student said in grief, why is it you that had to be here? Izuku turned to face his classmate, he smiled. 
That was very nice of you to say, Izuku remarked sarcastically, glad to see you being ignorant as ever. What did you say? the boy asked. He walked over to Izuku, grabbing his collar. Now you're resorting to violence, Izuku asked with a bored expression. How heroic of you. They stood there in silence until the teacher slapped them both on the head. Enough with the fighting, both of you. I don't want to see that again, the teacher said. The boy turned to his desk. Bye-bye, Izuku said quietly. He waved his hand. What's wrong with him? asked one student behind Izuku. Pay no attention, he's just trying to mess with us, said another. He should have ended up in prison. Izuku ignored them. They were all insignificant to him. Midoriya, the teacher walked up to him after the last class ended. Don't provoke them right now, it's a tough time for most of them. Izuku looked at the teacher with perplexity. He had to clear his ears in order to make sure he heard what he thought he did. Whatever you say, teacher, Izuku responded back. He left the building, heading towards the downtown area. Is this what I'm really dealing with on a minor scale, Izuku thought? It's already gotten this bad. How many more people are going to be thrown away to rot? Izuku moved his backpack towards him. He opened the top and took out a pencil and notebook that he had brought with him. Time to look around, Izuku said gleefully. I wonder what quirks I'll learn about today. His habit of analyzing information was the last trait Izuku had kept unchanged. It did not take him long to find an alleyway with the sound of people brawling. Lucky, Izuku said, he put his hands together. Quietly Izuku walked closer to the fight that had taken place. He noticed that there were mostly thugs, but one of the aggressors stood out. Show me your blood, the towering figure screamed. He picked up one thug by the head, the lifeless body lifted away from the ground. Before Izuku could examine the quirk, the thug's head exploded from the tremendous amount of force exerted on it. A small amount of blood sprayed onto Izuku's notebook, yet his eyes lit up with excitement from what he had witnessed. What was that, Izuku thought? He only saw for a brief moment when the man's hand grew in size. Did he just alter his physical strength? Izuku was lost in a million discussions that his mind went through. His habit of muttering long sentences began to spill out. Izuku instinctively started writing down observations and theories of the quirk the man used to commit murder with. Blonde hair. Around two meters tall and Izuku was interrupted by a body flying past his face. He initially thought he had been seen, but the blonde man continued fighting the remaining gang members. Izuku looked at the headless body that rested beside his feet. It was a shame, he thought. He would never learn its quirk. Is that all that you've got weaklings? The murderer asked. I was told it would be worth my time fighting you. The man opened up his arms, inviting them to hit him. I'll give you one chance. You can hit me, and I won't block it with my arms. The thugs hesitated. One of them then quickly rushed forward sticking out a combat knife towards the man's chest. Izuku could not see well from the man's back. Yet he noticed that he stood unworried. The murderer chuckled to himself before grabbing the thug by his hand, smashing him against the wall. Izuku finally saw what the unknown man's quirk manifested into. Muscle fibers surrounded his arm and chest, the knife still protruded out of it. The man took out the blade, throwing it down on the ground. Didn't say I wasn't going to use my quirk, the man cracked up. He reverted back to his regular form. Screw that, I don't want to die here, said one of the thugs running off. The rest who were alive followed suit. The blonde man scoffed. Weaklings. He was about to exit the alleyway before a quiet sound behind him caught his attention. The man turned around, he noticed something prodding a thug he killed earlier with what looked like a pencil. What the hell, the man thought before slowly walking up towards the site. It took him by surprise when he saw a teen in his school uniform looking at the body with a curious expression. The boy mumbled to himself, occasionally writing down something in his notebook. The man interrupted him. Shouldn't you be in school, little boy? It confused him as to how the kid in front of him remained calm from his presence, let alone the fact that a dead body was laying in front of him. Izuku looked up towards the man, realizing that he had been found out. He stopped writing in his notebook. Class is already ended, Izuku responded back. Can you give me just a second to finish this up? 
The man continued to stare at the boy. He was puzzled from what he heard. Who are you affiliated with? He asked, looking at the bloodied notebook. He felt a weird vibe from the boy. It gave off mixed signals. I'm just someone who is interested in quirks, Izuku responded. He closed his notebook. That doesn't answer my question, the man said. He tensed up his arms for a possible confrontation. Izuku stood up, bringing his body up to face the man. It's just me, but... He stopped. The more I look at you, it reminds me of a villain I have read about. Before the man could respond, Izuku raised his voice. Ah, I remember your quirk, you're muscular, aren't you? Izuku asked with interest. That's right, muscular replied. He was impressed that someone recognized him. Izuku changed his tone, he looked happy. Your quirk is amazing, it's like so strong. Powerful enough to pretty much overtake anyone. Um, thanks, I guess, Muscular said, not knowing what else to say. His day was just getting weirder and weirder. What kind of other things can you do? How long can you use it for? Are there any side effects? What made you decide to go down the villain path? Izuku rambled on. He spoke almost without taking a breather. Jesus kid. Calm down, will you? Muscular asked. He rested one hand on his head, shaking the back of his hair slightly. The boy piqued his interest. Why isn't he scared of me? Shouldn't he be afraid that I'll kill him? Muscular thought. Oh sorry, Izuku said, shifting his head down. Don't be, Muscular said reassuringly. Say, you didn't happen to have anyone know or follow you on the way here. Izuku thought for a second. He looked at the alleyway entrance he came through earlier. No, I don't think so. Muscular let out a grin. Good. He raised his hand, forming a punching stance towards the boy. Muscular flung his fist towards Izuku. The blow created enough force to dent the building wall. Cracks formed around the stone. Izuku looked to his left. The fist had barely scratched him. He felt a sharp pain on his cheek. Blood dripped slowly to the ground. Not bad, Muscular said. I don't sense any fear in you. However, I suggest you forget what you saw here earlier, for both of our sakes. He looked at the notebook that Izuku had held from the beginning. I'll be taking that? Huh, Izuku asked. He then realized what had happened, attempting to grab it back. But you can't, it's mine. What did you say? Muscular asked. He glanced at Izuku with rage, stopping the boy from complaining. Muscular then folded the notebook and placed it in his back pocket. Izuku looked at the bent notebook protruding out. He drifted his eyes with a disappointed look, knowing it would be best not to provoke the man who killed others with relative ease. You should be glad I'm letting you live. I would have killed you if you attempted to run away, Muscular said. The alleyway had begun to reek of blood. He had already wasted too much time talking. You're a bit on the weird side, but I like you. Muscular stepped back. He created a large set of muscles around his legs. What's your name, kid? Izuku, Izuku Midoriya, he said without thinking. Ha, didn't your parents ever tell you to never give out your name to strangers? Muscular asked. He shook his head in disbelief. Well I, ooh, Izuku staggered. Muscular jumped into the air, passing over the building in front of him. Izuku fell from the knockback. He got back on his feet after a few seconds, scraping the dirt off his shoulder. Holy shit, Izuku said, the jump startled him. He naturally moved his hand around to find his notebook, upon which he realized he no longer had any more. He opened his school bag, taking out another one. Izuku wrote down everything he could remember. As he finished, Izuku wiped his forehead. He was surprised to feel sweat. Time to head out before anyone realizes I was here, Izuku muttered. He heard police sirens in the distance as he left the street. Inside a small lounge, a man sat by the counter waiting for the bartender to finish his drink. The door slammed open, Muscular entered through with an annoyed look. Jurin, the place you sent me to, had a bunch of nobodies there, Muscular said. It was a complete waste of my time. Jurin took out a burning cigarette from his mouth, butting the end of it inside a receptacle. He exhaled a large puff of smoke to the side. Don't be like that. Their boss had some intel on the existence of our organization, Jurin said with a calm look. I take it you destroyed the files in his safe? 
Muscular walked over to the bar counter and sat parallel to Juran from across two seats. He waved off to the bartender, who had his face and arms covered in black mist. I'll get an IPA, tap of your choice. The bartender nodded. He handed over Juran the drink he made earlier. Yeah, they're gone. It's the last we should hear of them either, Muscular responded. Juran grabbed his drink and took a sip. Good. Small or not in scale, right now the boss is intending on playing his cards right, Juran said, looking at the glass. He put the cigarette back between his teeth. Muscular shrugged. As long as I get to kill someone, I guess it's tolerable. Speaking of waiting until the time is right, the bartender asked. Did we hear anything about looking for more potential villains to join our cause? Juran exhaled and looked at the bartender. Well, I have been looking Kurajiri, but so far it's a mixed bag. Kurajiri placed a glass under the tap, pouring beer into it. What do you mean it's a mixed bag, he questioned. Well, for starters, I already found some that passed the criteria. But the number is small, and only a few I still have to get background checks on, Juran noted. That doesn't sound too bad, Kurajiri stated, closing the tap. Juran took out his cigarette once more, he waved it around in his hand. I have already searched extensively in the entire applicant pool, and it's not necessarily increasing too. That's why we exist, stated Tamira Shigaraki behind them. Muscular turned around and saw a young man with light blue hair. Great, Muscular thought to himself. Another kid I have to deal with today. His eyes slowly opened. Hey Jurin, I actually came in for another reason today. He grabbed the glass of beer Kurajiri handed him. Does the name Izuku Midoriya ring any bells? Jurin thought for a second. No, it doesn't. Why do you ask? Muscular reached for his back pocket, grabbing the notebook he took earlier. Met him there when I was killing off the rest of the group. I think you might be interested in seeing this. Muscular said. He put the notebook on the table and slid it over to him. What's this? Juran asked. The notebook he looked at had no title. I grabbed this off him when I talked to him. I don't know who he is, but he was an interesting fellow, Muscular said gulping down the last ounce of his drink. Take a look. Juran opened the notebook, revealing detailed information on Muscular's quirk. Several pages explained the quirk's weaknesses, abilities, and ways on how to improve it. What's scary about this is that it's all true. He wrote all of that after seeing me use my quirk maybe two or three times, Muscular said seriously. Juran was surprised. There were a few things in the notebook even he did not know about. Interesting indeed, Juran noted. He placed the cigarette inside the bowl. Is this something that has to do with his quirk? Muscular asked Kyrgyri for another glass. Not certain, I don't even know if that boy is a villain. The entire group was taken aback. I'm surprised you even let someone live, nevertheless the fact that it was a child, Kyrgyri said. Muscular dismissed his comment. That's not the point. He's probably 13 or 14, but I think he's good enough to join the league. Can't speak for his fighting skills, though. Juran sighed audibly. I can't deny what you've shown me. I hate to say it, but his talent exceeds my own when it comes to quirk analysis, he agreed with Muscular. Tamura attempted to grab the notebook, but was stopped by Juran. That's up for Muscular to decide. If he wants you to see, then he'll give it to you. Tamura walked away, clawing his fingers at his throat with frustration. Juran walked up and passed the notebook over to Muscular. Apart from this wonderful news, you've actually decided to visit at a perfect time. The boss is here, Juran pointed out. The entire group was surprised once again, there was no news of his arrival. Clapping was heard in a dark hallway behind them. As expected of you, Juran, you never fail to entertain me with your antics. You flatter me, sir, but I'm just an old man with connections, Juran replied with respect. I heard the conversation you had. I am curious in the boy as well, he may prove useful to us, the voice pointed out. A man wearing a suit appeared out of the door, a large mask covered his entire head and neck area. Indeed, all for one it is, as you say, Juran said. However, I am not certain how to approach this scenario, we know nothing about him. 
There is no need to worry about that, I will personally assess him myself, all for one stated. Tamura had been watching from the sidelines, he did not like the interest his master took towards the boy. All for one looked at the group gathered at the bar. That covers it then, good work all of you. The preparations are coming along nicely. The mask covered his smile. Jiren nodded. Would you like me to inform the non-present members of anything? That won't be necessary, all for one said. He put his hand up. Focus on the recruits. And Tamura, the mask turned to face him. I will need to speak with you soon. Tamura walked into the pitch black hallway that his master had come through earlier. He tripped over a small crack, almost falling down before he regained his footing. All for one gave off a small chuckle, he stopped to look at the hair that streamed across a hand on the young villain's face. I apologize Tamura, I did not stop to consider that you could not see. The lighting should be installed here soon. It's alright master, my eyes just haven't adjusted yet. I'm sorry for delaying you, Tamura said, not wanting to disappoint all for one. All for one turned around, he continued to walk down the seemingly unending path. Master, may I ask why you wanted to speak with me? Tamira asked, still holding one hand along the wall. Everything I wish to tell you will be said in time. There is no need to rush things, Tamira, all for one told him. You seem to have been troubled lately. Part of me calling you today is because of that, the other reason I will explain to you once we arrive. Tamira's eyes had finally adjusted to the dark, he caught up to all for one. I'm perfectly fine, I'm not a kid anymore, Tamira said. Tamira, all for one said chillingly, he stopped once more. Do not lie to me ever again. Your emotions are unbalanced. Need I only look at you, and the entire picture appears in front of me. All for one's presence towered over Tamira, making the young man afraid of the repercussions. Moments passed yet nothing happened. Tamura never understood what his master thought underneath the mask, but his love and respect for the man in the suit were greater than anyone in the world. All for one took him in ever since he was a child, giving him food, shelter, and a place he could call home. Tamura considered the man his own father. Silence stood over between them. It was interrupted by all for one taking a step towards a door that had appeared in front of them. Follow me, all for one said. They stepped through the door that had opened by itself. The place revealed a small room resembling an office. It had been refurbished everywhere, a large desk was spaced out in the middle. The man gestured to Mira to sit down at one of the seats. All for one walked over to a large leather chair and sat down. He put his elbows on the table, crossing his hands together. You disagree with the decision I made with Juran earlier. Tamura stood in silence. His hand had grabbed the top of the chair, but his body froze. I don't disagree with your decide, Tamura said, before being interrupted. Sit before you speak, all for one ordered. Tamura sat down quickly, he was afraid. Yes, master, he said in a small, hushed breath. Do you believe I made a mistake in wanting to recruit the boy? All for one repeated. No, it's just that, Tamira stopped, he did not want to show his envy. Just what? All for one asked. He grew impatient with the young man. Tamira nervously readjusted the hand that blocked his face. There was no chance of getting out of the question. Tamira thought quickly, he chose the best option available. Isn't he just a kid? Seems like a waste of time and effort into making someone join. He might possibly not even be a villain. All for one looked at him, knowing it was likely not the real answer Tamira had in his mind. Yet the response all for one received was not bad either. Funny you should mention that. When I brought you in, were you not just a little boy? All for one pointed out. Some of the recruits that have joined, or will be soon, are of his age as well. Tamira sat in silence. There was no arguing with the man he feared and respected. You are right about the last part though, he said. All for one changed his hand posture. However, that doesn't mean it's not impossible. Even if the boy is not a villain, ideologies can be changed. Tamira felt a slight relief. His answer had barely passed as legitimate. He moved his head up, scratching his neck from anxiety. The other reason I called you here for, 
is that you'll be taking over the operations and leading them once we are ready, all for one said. This surprised Tamira. He never expected his master to put such a heavy responsibility on him. He felt compelled to earn all for one's trust. I have high hopes in you. Hopefully, this will prove to be a useful teaching experience, all for one told him. A smile touched Tamira's lips. Of course, master. Izuku continued walking the streets on a Sunday night, attempting to find any quirk that intrigued him. Two days had passed since he met Muscular, and during that time he had not found anyone that excited him as much then. Ouch, Izuku whispered. He looked at his bandaged right hand he had accidentally cut the night before. The wound still stung, and he could see that it reopened. A small red stain appeared in the middle of his palm. Izuku walked past several passers-by before feeling a large rumble in his stomach. He had been preoccupied with searching for villains that his mind had forgotten to eat the entire day. Guess now wouldn't be a bad time to take a break, Izuku said quietly. He took out his wallet, two 1,000 yen bills sat inside. He looked around and spotted a fast food restaurant. Izuku frowned. No real option here. He opened the door, revealing a run-down place. Izuku walked over to the ordering station, but no employees were in sight. Izuku could tell that they did not get many customers. Oh sorry, shouted out a voice in the back of the store. A fat burly man stepped out, greeting Izuku. He placed his hands on the counter. What can I get you? Izuku looked at the signs above him. I'll get combo number six. He passed over the two bills to the man. Pick any drink you want from the fridge, the man pointed out, returning Izuku his change. Izuku looked at his hand, he had been short-handed. Sure, Izuku said. No wonder this place is shutting down, he thought to himself. Izuku walked over to the fridge, at the corner of his eyes, something caught his attention. The only customer in the restaurant besides Izuku stared at him profusely. Izuku felt uncomfortable, but disregarded it. He walked back to the counter for his food. Sorry for making you wait. Here you go, a double patty with fries, the large man said with enthusiasm. Thanks, Izuku muttered, grabbing the plastic tray. He was not going to bother arguing with what happened earlier. Izuku turned around and walked over to a table in front of him that was the furthest away from the other customer. He placed the tray down and sat facing the street window. He grabbed his bag, taking out the notebook he had been writing in while observing quirks. The other person continued staring at Izuku intensely, for minutes even at a time. Izuku tried not to pay attention, but his curiosity got the best of him. He looked up and made eye contact with a girl that looked around his age. Izuku quickly looked down, his face flustered. Oh God, Izuku thought. He shifted his eyes nervously, looking at his notes. Why has she been staring at me for so long? Izuku was not certain if he had been found out once more from his outings. Better to just keep to myself and leave soon. He was interrupted by the chair in front of him moving. Izuku was preoccupied in his thoughts and did not realize in time that the girl he had looked at earlier sat down right in front of him. What the hell? Izuku shouted inside his mind. The girl's sudden appearance startled him even more. Who is she? Hello there, cutie, the girl said, resting her chin on her hand. WWWHWA, what? Izuku said in surprise. He did not know how to handle the greeting that appeared to smash his face wide open. He was not used to talking directly to girls. The girl laughed, smiling at him. Just saying hi. Geez, you are super cute. She looked at Izuku's bandaged arm. Izuku noticed and quickly moved his hand underneath the table. Awa, she cried out, puffing her face. I just wanted to look at it. Izuku was confused. The girl was beyond his comprehension. Um, why? It was the only response he could think of. He knew he had to choose his words carefully. Because I like blood silly, the girl said with an amused tone. And I like you. I... I, I, thanks, Izuku responded. He did his best not to look at the girl directly. You're so adorable when you look away, the girl teased him. I'm Toga Himeko, but you can call me Toga if you want. Why is she so friendly with me? Does she really like me that much? Izuku pondered. What's your name? 
Toga asked spontaneously. Izuku knew better not to give out his name this time, but he felt something pointing at his leg, slowly rising up. Izuku gulped down his throat, realizing what she was doing. Izuku, he said quietly. The knife underneath the table still continued to move towards his inner left thigh. Midoriya. Izuku gave up, knowing it was best not to upset her. Izuku, Midoriya, Toga repeated, lifting the knife away from his leg. She smiled. Can I call you Izu-chan? Izuku's face blushed. He put his hands up to cover his face. Please. Please don't call me by that name, he said nervously. Why not Izu-chan, Toga said. She began to enjoy teasing him more. Before Izuku could respond back, Toga grabbed his injured arm and started caressing it with her cheek. Himiko, I mean Toga. Dubby, what are you doing? Izuku asked. Toga then tapped his nose with her right hand. Boop. Izuku sat there in silence, giving up on trying to question her. Toga examined his hand before grabbing something from her cardigan. She then wrote on his notebook. He looked and saw a phone number that she had written down in cursive. Next to it, a heart was drawn, with a smiley face inside. His eyes flashed before noticing that the mysterious girl stood up and began walking to the exit of the restaurant. Their eyes met once more as Toga made a phone gesture towards her ear, mouthing off the words, Call me. The door closed. Izuku replayed the scenario in his head a thousand times before he finally understood what had happened. He sat in his chair like a deer staring at car headlights. He was suddenly brought back from a voice that called out to him. Sir, we are already closing down for tonight, the man said behind the counter glass. Izuku nodded. He stood up and threw his half-finished burger into the trash. He walked outside, heading back to his house. Just what was that? Izuku asked to himself. Why did I even let myself get pushed around by her? He placed his hand on his forehead. The thought of a girl liking him was something he always wanted, but his interest lay more into whether she had any ulterior motives. That's just not something someone normal would do. She had a goddamn knife, Izuku thought. Yet he could not deny that it made his heart race a little. She might know my name, but if I'm careful, I'll avoid walking into her at public places, Izuku said. Calling her is definitely out of the question. Izuku grabbed his notebook to erase her message, but realized quickly that it was not written with a regular pencil. Ink? Wait, no, is that blood? Izuku sighed. Yeah, definitely not meeting her again. Izuku maintained a steady pace. He thought about all of the close encounters that he had come across after deciding to observe villains. Izuku tried his best to be quiet and cautious, but at some point there could come a time when he would have to defend himself. Best option right now would be getting a knife, but the problem is that I am not familiar with using it properly, Izuku muttered, let alone the difficulty in getting a proper one. Izuku crossed a small road and entered a shortcut that passed in between a small community of houses. Oh, I'm impressed with how well you articulate your thoughts when it comes to hurting others. Izuku heard a deep voice address him. A tall figure leaned across a tree. Izuku was not able to see the man's face. Izuku formed a defensive stance, but his body was telling him to run. No need to get defensive, young man, said the man. I take it you've already grown tired of people surprising you. Izuku stayed quiet, assessing whether the person in front of him was a threat. Are you a villain? Izuku asked with a straight face. Indeed I am, but I have not come here to be your enemy, said the voice. In fact, I am here to offer you a proposition. The man stepped forward, revealing a giant mask that covered his entire head. I am the leader of a specific organization that centers itself towards giving villains a voice. In fact, you might know one of the members you had met a few days ago. He goes by the code name. What was it? Muscular Yes. Izuku was interested in what the man in the mask had to say. And why have you, the leader, decide to confront me alone? That seems a little suspicious. The man in the suit laughed. I have to give it to you for not stumbling at what I had said previously. It seems as if you had expected for this to happen. He took one step closer to Izuku. The reason why I am here is that I am the only one who can offer you to become special. 
someone strong, someone who could enact revenge against the world and false heroes who had left him to suffer. Izuku was not able to understand what the man meant. What does he mean to make me special? How could I become strong? It seems you do not understand just what I can do young Midoriya, the mask said. Breathing sounds were heard going through tubes exiting the back. I am offering you a quirk, a powerful one at that. Izuku stood in disbelief. He did not know how the man knew he was quirkless. He thought to himself if it was really even possible to be given a quirk artificially. And what do you want in return, he asked sternly. Amazing, you really are able to comprehend things quickly, the man responded. I only wish you to join us however, I do not want to force you. This is your decision to make. We are aware of your extraordinary skills when it comes to analyzing quirks. Your past has created the mindset of the perfect villain, and I thought it would be a waste to let that go. Izuku was impressed with how the man knew everything about him. He did not know if it was a quirk that allowed him to read minds, but something was different about the man who had decided to confront him. I'm interested, Izuku said. An opportunity had finally jumped into his hands, letting go of it was not an option. Izuku thought of several ideas that would explain the man's quirk, but nothing came to mind. In that case, you will need this, the man replied. There is only one contact here, call it tomorrow exactly at 5 p.m., and you will be given instructions on where to go. He handed an old phone into Izuku's hand. I look forward to speaking with you again. Izuku watched the man exit the shortcut. He never expected this encounter to have happened so fast. Izuku let out a large sigh. He knew everything, just who was that. He looked at the phone that was given to him. It was covered in glitter, with pink embroidery. Ha, this is just something else, Izuku chuckled. He smiled and looked at the moon. Isn't this just great? Izuku sat in his room, staring at the phone he was given by the mysterious man in the mask he had met last night. It's finally happening, Izuku emphasized. He did not know if he could trust anyone, especially the man who had offered him a quirk. The leader of a group of villains wants me to join him. He mentioned muscular, which means that they most likely saw my notebook. Izuku snickered. His plan had somehow worked, though he never expected it to happen so quickly. He twirled a pencil in his hand, the clock read 4 minutes until 5 p.m. Izuku picked up the phone, flipping it open. One contact was seen on the list with a phone number below it, but no name was written down. Izuku knew it was a burner phone, deciding to write down the number in case anything happened to it. I wonder if the leader will pick up, this is just too exciting. He rolled around in his bed with enthusiasm, burying his face into a pillow. Two more minutes, two more minutes. Quirks. They definitely will have some interesting ones, Izuku said with a muffled voice. The sunset had begun to gloom over Izuku's bedroom. Posters that surrounded his walls were nowhere to be seen, figurines and other merchandise on his desk and shelves were thrown away. The room was bland, yet it made Izuku happier. The hero who Izuku believed in and worshipped was now a memory he wanted to bury deep inside his mind, but no matter how hard he tried, he could never forget it. Izuku took a deep breath before lifting his face from the pillow. 30 seconds. Izuku quickly rose up in a sitting position, he stared at the contact, his finger hovered over the dial button. Click. Izuku pressed the pink phone against his ear, waiting for a response. Five seconds passed, then ten. He was worried no one would answer until he heard a phone get picked up on the receiving end. Hello? Izuku asked without skipping a beat. I am assuming this is Midoriya, said a scrambled voice. Yes, it is, Izuku replied. Man, they are crafty. My master had informed me to notify you of where he wishes you to go. Specifically today, the voice spoke with cool courtesy. We expect you to be there no later than two hours. Okay, where do I need to go? Izuku asked, his hands trembled. I will provide you with the address in the form of a text momentarily. The call ended before Izuku could reply. He looked at the phone screen, shortly after a message appeared showing an address. Okay, time to go, Izuku said. He grabbed a knife he had taken earlier from the kitchen. Izuku rolled up his shirt, revealing a makeshift holster that sat around his hip. 
Izuku shrugged before putting the knife inside. Getting really tired of people walking up on me unannounced, he said as he put on a gray sweater. I don't really know what to expect, but it's better than being empty-handed. Izuku arrived towards the street he was given. The sky had grown dark, droplets of rain began to hit his face. In the alleyway stood a moderately sized commercial building, showing no signs of any villainous activity around it. Just a normal building, don't know what I was expecting, Izuku said, almost laughing to himself. He walked over to it, noticing there were only two entrances. Izuku glanced upwards, a security camera stared at him with a tinted red glow. He stepped over to one door and attempted to open it, yet the handle stood in place. Izuku looked to the right, noticing a post box resting inside the brick wall. He stood for a second before realizing what it was there for. Izuku shifted over to the box and opened it, revealing a shaft that exited through the other side. Makes sense, Izuku said. He grabbed the phone from his pocket. I guess they want this back. He placed it inside and closed the hatch, waiting for a response. The rain had grown heavier, pouring down relentlessly on his hair and clothing as Izuku waited for what seemed an eternity. The door handle rattled after a few seconds passed, a voice was heard inside right after, come in. Izuku grabbed the door handle and opened the door, which caused the joints to creak loudly. Welcome to the League of Villains, said a tall figure in a formal suit, bowing towards Izuku. Izuku slowly closed the door behind him, attempting not to make any more noise than necessary. Before he could close the door fully, one of the hinges ripped apart from the wall. Izuku ducked in time as the door swung back open, only to be stopped from falling to the ground from the bottom hinge that stood untouched. Izuku looked at the man in front of him, then to the door and back to the man again. Uh, D.D.I., that wasn't supposed to happen, Izuku blurted out. He attempted to put the door back into its place, only for it to fall down again. This building is a little rundown. Do not worry about it, said the man. Izuku looked back and noticed the person speaking to him had features that were different for a regular human to have. The name is Kurajiri, it is a pleasure to meet you. Izuku was still embarrassed from what transpired, he looked towards Kyujiri with a nervous smile. Midoriya, nice to meet you as well. Follow me, the master wishes to see you, Kyujiri said. They walked through a hallway before entering a lounge with a bar on the right. Several unfinished drinks stood on the counter. Kyujiri shifted his head to the direction of Izuku. I take it you do not intend on doing anything out of the ordinary? Izuku looked at the fog coming out of Kyujiri's white collar, a cold smile appeared on his face, yet his light-hearted tone had not changed. Of course not, I do not wish to cause any more trouble. Kyujiri felt a slight change in character from the boy behind him, but chose to ignore it. He faced towards a man that sat in one of the couch sofas. Twice, we've run into a little accident at the front door, Kyujiri said with a calm voice, pointing to the hallway from where they had entered from. Would you please fix it? Twice instantly stood up. His mask was not able to cover the happiness he got from someone remembering his name. Sure thing, my man, he said, running past them while humming a song. Izuku observed the man in black spandex run towards the entrance. Izuku stared with confusion as twice began to skip in long strides, arguing with himself if he was pretty. Don't bother with him, Kirjiri sighed. He shook his head. He's had a troubled past but twice proved himself to be quite useful for us. I would imagine, Izuku responded. Well then, it's best we do not keep the master waiting, Kirajiri resumed. Enter the door to your left, he'll greet you shortly. Kirajiri walked over to the bar, he grabbed the glasses and went to the sink to wash them. Very down-to-earth place, Izuku thought without a second to spare. Aren't they worried I'll do something? Izuku circled towards the door Kyujiri told him to enter, but was interrupted by a group of people talking, seemingly getting louder as they approached the lounge from another hallway. Before he could turn the handle, his eyes opened as he saw the girl he had met last night walk towards the bar. Oh Jesus, Izuku said to himself, attempting to open the door without alerting her. And so, like I saw this cute boy, and I really wanted to mess him up, but you know, 
I guess it can't be helped that we were in a public place, Toga explained, before letting out an angry cry. And you know what? I gave him my phone number, and he hasn't even called me yet, isn't he stupid Dabai? Dabai looked at Toga with a defeated look, haven't you already told me this around five times today? At this point, I think I know how he looks better than I do myself. He shifted one hand across the front of his black hair. The sound of a door opening caught Dabai's attention immediately. He looked at who it was before he pieced it together. Dabai pointed towards Izuku. Wait, isn't that him? Toga instantly turned around to face the door Izuku opened. Her face blushed. Izuku, what are you doing here? I was worried you'd never call. Toga attempted to walk forward, but was suddenly interrupted by the door slamming shut. She stood in place silently. Hey, come back here, Toga shouted, instantly running towards the door. She was stopped by Dabai grabbing onto her school uniform. Wait, Dabai commanded. That room is off limits. Toga looked at Dabai with an annoyed face. Then why is he going in there? That is because the master requested it, Kyrgyri said behind the counter, wiping a glass with a towel in his hands. He had seen the entire situation unfold. Why? I haven't even seen the leader personally myself, Toga retorted. Just who is that handsome, mysterious boy? Interesting that you should ask. A few people including Master had taken an interest in him. Possibly, he will be recruited into the League. Toga's face grew even redder. Oh, so, he's a bad boy? She placed both of her hands on her cheeks. Sneaky little guy, you like playing tricks, huh? Dabai let go of Toga after realizing she would no longer attempt to follow after the boy. Izuku, Dabai muttered, he was definitely interested as well as to why the leader took an interest in him. If we're recruiting kids like him, that means he's a little different, Dabai pointed out. Kirajiri, how much do you know about him? Kirajiri looked at the door before placing the glass on the counter. From what I understand, his ability is to analyze quirks and then determine their value, which the man who recruited you personally said he was outmatched in that regard. As for the rest, I do not know, but there must be something else, I'd have to say. Dabai readjusted his jacket, he sat down by the counter. Different indeed, I can definitely see that now. He ran his finger across the table, swiping it up afterwards. I am not going to be able to refrain her once he comes out. If he comes out. Kyrgyri laughed. He should be fine. I cannot really read into his personality, but he gives off that aura. He does now? Dabai asked with a curious expression. Very interesting. Izuku stood inside an empty room with two wooden chairs fixed in the middle, facing each other at a close distance. A small lamp burned brightly, illuminating the walls and floor. Izuku moved his eyes to spot anything out of the ordinary, but did not find anything. He walked over to one of the chairs and sat down. Izuku waited for a while before a portal appeared behind the other chair. The masked figure Izuku met last night approached towards him. I apologize for my tardiness. Lately, there have been a few changes in the schedule. Oh no, it's fine, Izuku paused for a moment, waving his arms. I just got here. Well, I am glad you have decided to consider my offer, the man said. I understand you came here because you wish to join us? I do, Izuku said, but I still have some questions. Everything you told me sounds way too good to be true, and quite honestly I can't trust you or anyone else here. A fair reason. I suppose it would be better to make you trust me as soon as possible. I go by the name of all for one however, I ask that you do not go around spreading that name. Take it as you wish, but me wanting to recruit you is genuine. Is that because you saw the notebook Muscular took from me? Izuku asked. He saw his reflection through all for one's mask. It did not seem so far that the leader was lying to him. Impressive young man, but I did give you hints regarding that, all for one told him. That is one of the reasons why I want you, but the other is a bit more complicated. Izuku had his suspicions from the last comment. What do you mean by complicated, he asked, shifting one leg on top of the other. I want you here also because of the potential inside of you. I have never seen anyone else exert that type of promise, 
all for one said, only speaking half the truth. His smile lay unseen behind the mask blocking his face. By giving you a quirk, all I ask is that you work for us. A small price to pay back. Izuku knew he was being flattered. Seems awfully nice of you to be giving me so much. All for one chuckled. See, that is what I like about you. Behind the little scared kid act you pull, lays a dormant power of emotion that has been cultivated through years of pain and suffering, he said. There is no need to put on this act in front of me. He crossed his arms around his chest. I had planned to confront you about this later, but I see now that it is best to clear that up with you. You have already shown me glimpses of it. The boy sat motionless upon hearing what all for one said to him. The silence was broken after Izuku's eyes looked at him coldly. I guess I didn't try hard enough, Izuku said, changing his tone. His nervous attitude had completely disappeared. You seem to know a lot about me, but I can't deny that I am not happy about this opportunity. He lifted his sweater, taking out the knife from its holster, dropping it into the ground. I apologize for being suspicious, granted that I wouldn't have been able to do anything with it anyway. All for one looked down at the knife. Even he was surprised at how sudden and different Izuku appeared. You are right that it would not have made a difference, all for one said calmly. Even someone with a quirk would not make it out alive from this building if they attacked us. I know right, Izuku said, smiling at the mask. Well, I am not stupid enough to actually do that. I am just glad someone has taken an interest in me so quickly. Oh, you mean to say you wanted this right off the start? All for one asked with curiosity. I suppose. However, I didn't have any ways of confirming the existence of a villain organization, Izuku responded. All for one clapped slowly. You really are interesting, Izuku Midoriya, he said lightheartedly. I will give you the opportunity to seek retribution. All for one stood up from his chair, walking up to the boy. Izuku stood still. All for one moved his arm, placing it on top of Izuku's head. Is something suppo? Izuku felt a sharp jolt run across his body. The pain caused him to fall to the ground, he was unable to move no matter how much he attempted to thrash around. Izuku began to breathe heavily, his head diffused all five of his sensations. The last thing Izuku heard was all for one's chilling laughter. Izuku opened his eyes, noticing that he sat on his chair once more. He could make out all for one pacing around slowly, which made Izuku assume he was waiting for him. Izuku's pain subsided, but his head and body still felt sluggish. He moved his head from his shoulder. All for one noticed. He moved the chair and sat down. Glad to see you alive and kicking. You could have warned me, Izuku said. He attempted to clear his mind. That hurt like hell. Did you expect me to give you a cookie and have it eaten with some tea? All for one asked. Izuku smirked. Of course not. But what did you do to me? I've given you a quirk of course, and one that would fit you very well. Given all of the things you have experienced, all for one declared. If you learn how to wield it properly, then I doubt anyone would want to fight you. Izuku coughed, looking at all for one. Even you. Already turning into a comedian I see, all for one laughed, dismissing the question. The echo rattled among the room, bouncing from the concrete ceiling. A smile exited from his lips, he could not imagine how much the boy would prove useful to him. I think it would be best for you to figure out the quirk yourself. I have only recently acquired it, so I do not know everything about it, he specified. Your body should be able to move in a little bit. A gate appeared beside all for one, he paused before entering it. Oh, and I think a good name for your quirk would be reciprocity. Use it well. He stepped through the portal, disappearing into the void. Reciprocity? Izuku asked to himself. Like exchanging gifts between one another? He stopped to think but that wouldn't make any sense. Over time Izuku began to feel the sensation of his body. Gradually he was able to move his toes and then stand up from his chair. Izuku stumbled, almost crashing into the wall. Great, he thought, in for a real ride here. Izuku was finally able to regain his footing. He looked at the door from where he had come through earlier. He had no other option than to open it. 
Welcome back Midoriya, Kirijiri. Said, I take it that if you are still alive, you have been accepted. Yes, that is right, Izuku said, his legs were still wobbling. Say, can I get a glass of water? Kirijiri was not certain why the boy stumbled. He felt Izuku stare at him with unnerving attention. I'll make it right away, Kirijiri said with hesitation. It was as if a completely different person was standing in front of him. Izuku walked closer to the counter, noticing a man with black hair holding a drink. The name is Dabai, he said, and I'd advise you turn around before it is too late. Izuku heard a shout behind him. He quickly moved to his left, dodging someone charging at him at full speed. The person smashed into the counter with their head, falling down to the ground. This caused Kirijiri to jump in terror from the noise. He then realized that his precious bar had possibly been damaged. Owa, Toga groaned, rubbing the front part of her head. Why did you dodge me? she asked. Izuku stood in bewilderment as the girl rose up completely ignoring the fact that her forehead was bleeding immensely. Kirijiri rushed frantically to find a towel. He was not going to let the table drip any blood onto the carpet. Are you all right? Izuku asked with disinterest. Yeah, I'm okay, Toga replied, completely fine and dandy. Izuku looked at Toga, not knowing how to respond. He had purposefully tried to avoid her, but he was left staring at her face that was covered in blood. Why didn't you call me? Toga asked. Are you trying to play hard to get? She then slapped Izuku in the face, resulting in her covering her cheek from the sudden sharp pain she felt. Izuku turned his head to face Toga after being hit. He wiped the corner of his mouth with the back of his hand, revealing an irked look. He was interrupted suddenly by Toga. Ouch, why did that hurt me? Toga asked with perplexity. She looked at Izuku before a smile formed on her lips. This makes me excited. Toga was immediately grabbed by Dabai and pulled back. Idiot, don't you realize what he would have done if you kept provoking him? Huh? Toga inquired, looking up towards Dabai standing behind her. What do you mean? Dabai looked at Izuku. He's not the same person you met before. What? So you mean he really is a bad boy? asked Toga not paying attention to Dabai's warning, before Dabai could explain what he had seen. Izuku smiled, putting his hand up to show no aggression. It's fine. I appreciate the concern you have for her, but I won't do anything. Dabai looked at Izuku, still grabbing onto Toga. He did not know what the boy was thinking of. Only that for a split second he showed murderous intent stronger than anywhere he had seen. All right, Dabai replied back to Izuku releasing Toga back down. My bad for stopping your little lover's quarrel. Toga looked at Izuku happily. He called us lovers, she squealed, covering her face in excitement. Izuku shifted his head. The sudden anger he felt earlier had completely disappeared. He reached into his pocket, taking out a handkerchief. Here, take this and wipe the blood off your face. Izuku did not know how to feel around her. Izuku, you'll be late for school if you don't wake up, Inko shouted, loud enough for him to hear. Izuku grunted, he barely slept the night before. After running in with the League of Villains and ultimately joining them, he was told to meet one of the members back at the location the next following day. And to top it off, Izuku thought, all for one actually gave me a quirk. How could he even do that? His mind could barely contain the excitement of figuring it out fully. Izuku moved his left hand that rested on his bed and reached out to the ceiling as far as he could. He felt that he made actual progress into fulfilling his dream. To think so many people would become heroes only for the sake of fame, Izuku said quietly. Ironic that they call themselves that when they care more about themselves, or even worse, hurt others because they feel more superior. Izuku laughed at the idea of Katsuki becoming a hero and all the classmates that shunned him once they learned he had no quirk. Izuku stared at his protruding hand before dropping it back down. His mind jumped back onto the conversation he had with all for one. Izuku remembered the man hinting to him of what his quirk did. It had finally dawned on Izuku what all for one meant when he called it reciprocity. It most likely happened when I got hit by Toga, Izuku pondered, raising his chest up from the bed. When I got slapped by her, 
it was obvious that she felt pain the same time I did. Does that mean people feel the same pain if they physically hurt me? Izuku. The door to his room busted open, with his mother looking at him with an angry face. I don't know what's been going on with you lately, but you're going to miss school if you don't leave in a few minutes, she said frantically. Inko looked at the room for the first time in a while. What happened to all of your All Might merchandise? He looked at his mom before exhaling deeply. I grew out of it, mom. Inko looked at Izuku with a surprised gaze, then realizing she was holding him up from getting ready. We're going to have a talk about all of this after school when you get back, she said, closing the door with a loud bang. Inko was aware of her son acting strange ever since the incident that took place with Katsuki's death. She was worried that it had affected her son much deeper than she initially thought. Is he getting enough sleep? He seems completely out of it lately, Inko thought to herself. She walked over to the kitchen and grabbed Izuku's lunch. In his room, Izuku had put on his school uniform. He had forgotten what his mother told him. His only thoughts raced on the conceptualization of the new quirk he was given, and what he was to do this following afternoon. He stopped to look at the mirror on the wall out of habit. It was a routine tradition for him to look at it every morning and tell himself he could be a hero. Not anymore I can't, Izuku muttered. He had thrown that life away, there was no turning back. Inko marched over to her son's door upon realizing he had not exited yet. She opened it, revealing Izuku holding his hand near the handle. Oh well glad to see you waking up, Inko apologized, handing him the lunchbox. She looked at Izuku's face, yet felt no emotional response come out of him. In that moment, she suddenly believed she had seen her son show a regretful look. But Izuku stopped her train of thoughts by hugging her unexpectedly. He did not say a word, only letting go of her once she repeated to him multiple times that he would be late. Izuku stepped out of the apartment door, it was the last time he would ever see that place he thought. Izuku knew she cared for him on the outside level, never saying the things he needed to hear when he was depressed. But it was difficult to say goodbye to his mother. He did not wish to cause her any more trouble. I will never bother you again, Izuku said quietly, walking out of the apartment lobby. He knew him leaving would make his mother worry even more, but it was better than her finding out who he had become. The morning had grown bitter cold outside. Izuku shifted his arms closer to his jacket. His legs grew sore as he treaded towards the hideout. This better work out well, Izuku said bitterly. He walked by the towering buildings covering the street below, wearing a face mask and hat that covered his hair, preventing potential onlookers from recognizing him if the police put up a missing poster. Several police sirens were heard in the distance, gradually getting louder. Izuku looked, seeing several police cars race past him on the road to a distant fire. Another villain attack? asked one man to a woman. It's awfully getting more frequent. I wonder if All Might will save the day, she replied with hope. Izuku passed by them, pushing his head down as they looked at him for a moment. Izuku sighed with relief upon realizing they turned back to face the fire, still pointing towards the smoke that rose higher into the air. No matter how hard Izuku tried, the name All Might echoed in his mind. Izuku remembered the man standing above him, telling him it was impossible to become a hero. It's not like he was wrong, Izuku said to himself. Somewhere deep inside his heart, he still believed that All Might was the perfect hero the world never deserved. Eventually, Izuku approached the hideout, opening the door with a key Kirijiri had given him earlier. He could see the bartender pacing behind the bar, occasionally moving bottles around the shelves. Welcome back, Kirijiri said, upon noticing Izuku's arrival. Jiren is already here, but he told me to tell you to wait here until he comes back. Izuku nodded and walked over to one of the couches. He noticed another person sitting in a carefree position, twirling a knife in his hands. Izuku sat down, not paying much attention to him. So you really did join us? The man asked with a condescending tone. Izuku turned to face him. Is that a problem? Not necessarily, but I do not trust you Izuku Midoriya, said the man. What proof is there that you really are one of us? No need to show hostility to Mira. Save the little games for later, Juren said, coming into view. 
He might be new, but I'll show him the ropes around here. Tamir scoffed at Juran's comment. He placed the knife into a sheath, before tossing it at the coffee table. He looked at Izuku. You are useless to me, Midoriya. Don't expect me to buddy up with you just because Master took an interest in you. Tamura stood up and left the bar, grabbing onto his neck. Durin walked over to Izuku, pointing to the knife. I believe that is him declaring to you to prove yourself. Izuku thought to himself as to how much of a child the man named Tamura acted in front of him. And why should I take it seriously, Izuku asked. I wouldn't be surprised if he was held as an object ridiculed among most of you. Juran smirked. That may be so, but the boss wishes him to take the mantle in the near future. Best just to stay back and let him do his thing for now. For now? Kyrgyri asked him with a concerned voice. He had known Tamura ever since All for One brought him in as a child. Kyrgyri, you're misinterpreting what I meant, Juran said, sighing audibly. He took out a cigarette pack from his jacket. Tamira acts like a child often, but hopefully with his new position that will change for the better. Kirijiri loosened his shoulders. I see, sorry about that. Juran placed a cigarette in his mouth, bringing a lighter in between his hands. He opened the top of the metal case, sliding his thumb over the ignition. A puff of smoke came out from his nose. I suppose we should start heading out young man, Otherwise we'll be running late on time. Izuku rose up from the sofa. Of course, Um, he paused. Juran heaved another puff of smoke. You can call me Juran, it doesn't matter to me, he said, turning towards the exit. Oh, and I think that knife is yours now. He did a similar thing to other recruits recently. No harm in that then, Izuku said casually. He picked up the holster and placed it in his pocket. Izuku followed Juran into the entrance of a skyscraper he had never been in before. The staff whispered and hurried around after noticing Juran stepping in. Izuku was curious at the sight. Do they know you? Izuku asked. To some degree, Juran admitted. Granted it's only from a business perspective. They are not aware of the organization. They continued to walk to the front desk until the receptionist greeted them. Welcome back, sir. Juran nodded, looking at the man's face. Is it all right if I smoke here? The receptionist stared at Juran with a blank look, regaining his composure immediately after. Of course, sir, you are one of our most valued partners. You need not even ask. No need to be so stoic. Let the old man joke around a little, Juran said, looking at Izuku to see a response. Well anyways, I am here for a little shopping. He slid over a piece of paper on the table. The receptionist glanced at it before smiling. Glad to have you back. Please head over to the 23rd floor, and one of our associates will greet you there. Splendid, Juran replied. Sir. They were interrupted by the receptionist looking over the counter. Is this boy with you? Yes, yes he is. Juran smiled, revealing one of his front teeth missing. He gestured over Izuku to follow him. The receptionist turned back towards his computer, grabbing onto a phone. Izuku accompanied Juran over to a large elevator. I hope that won't be a problem, he asked. It's fine. I suppose they are surprised to see me not come alone here for once, Juran said amusingly. He pressed a button, calling down the elevator. Izuku was amazed at what he had witnessed earlier. Why was Juran known around here, and why so publicly? Izuku thought with perplexity. Juran, was there a reason for you bringing me here? Juran looked at the boy beside him. Of course there is. I brought you here because of your unique talents, but most importantly to prepare you for what you are going to face down the line. A noise was heard above them, indicating that the elevator arrived. The doors opened, with a security guard stepping out bowing the moment he saw Juran. There will be no need to join us, Juran said to the bodyguard, gesturing that they wanted to be left alone. As you wish, sir. Juran and Izuku stepped into the elevator. I suppose I can now tell you why we are here, Juran told him. The boss wants to get you some proper equipment, as he told me your quirk is centered more on the defensive side. Izuku looked at the elevator door, he could barely make out his reflection. Juran continued. 
This place will provide you with everything you need once you meet your actual instructor. I initially wanted to have you work alongside me, but I feel that your expertise would serve better in another field. In hindsight, Jurin had an underlining feeling that the boy would overshadow his own work, but he saw potential in training him as something even more terrifying. With his young age, it's definitely still possible to mold him, Jurin thought, smiling at what the boy beside him could become. Izuku had not given much thought at what Jurin implied, yet he was still excited at the new life he was given. Izuku's line of thought was suddenly interrupted. I was impressed to find out that your analysis skills had nothing to do with your actual quirk. How did you manage to do that? Well, I have always had a fascination for understanding quirks better. It's something I started doing ever since I was little. Jiren laughed. He was surprised at how unbelievable Izuku's answer was. You really do surprise me, young man, he said, looking at the floor indicator above him. We're almost here, and one last thing. Jiren turned towards the boy. I suggest you come up with an alias for yourself whenever you have the chance. Don't want to be spreading your actual name around. Izuku thought to himself. A code name was something he definitely needed if he wished to keep his identity safe. They were greeted by a woman in her thirties as soon as the elevator doors slid open. The gate master is waiting for you. Please follow me. Jiren glanced at Izuku, raising his eyebrows. I'll do the talking. Only speak if they address you. He walked out of the elevator with Izuku following after him. The woman opened a large set of wooden doors, revealing a wide circular room with an assortment of priceless furniture and paintings. In the middle stood the gate master adjusting his glasses. He placed a glass of whiskey on a stand to his left. Good afternoon, Mr. Juran. It's been a long time, said the gate master, crossing his hands together. What brings you here today? I've brought someone along that I wish to be put in your care, Juran responded. He looked at the glass of alcohol, a large smile appeared. You know me so well. Naturally, the gate master said. He then focused his attention on Izuku. And what sort of setup would this gentleman require? Go through the usual, Juran noted, but a quick and aggressive style would fit better I believe. Understood. Young man, please follow me. Izuku looked towards Juran. It's fine, I'll follow in once I finish that drink. Jiren said. Izuku followed the gate master at a distance. They arrived at another set of doors, at which two servants opened sharply. An aggressive approach, the gate master said quietly to himself. In that case, I assume you have all the other bases covered. Izuku attempted to respond, but was left in a momentary shock from what the room presented. An assortment of weapons spanned across one wall. To his left stood an old man wearing a tailored suit, patiently waiting for his cue. The gate master turned to face the old man. Richard, we'll start off with the attire. Take your time with him. The old man nodded, gesturing Izuku to come up to him. Please sit, he said with a raspy voice. Izuku was not able to make sure of what he had witnessed in the span of five seconds. He never knew this kind of world existed. Please lift up your arms, Richard said, taking out measuring equipment. He wrote down the sizes spanning across Izuku's body. The gate master watched with interest at the boy who sat on the opposite side of the room. Certainly, surprising that someone of his age has come here, he thought. Juran must have taken a real interest in him. Richard patted Izuku's upper shoulder with a mock-up suit. I believe, he paused, looking at Izuku's form, that a vest would suit you well. Izuku had no reason to question the man behind him, as he had no experience or proper opinions on the matter. The old man removed the piece of clothing from Izuku. He walked over to the gate master with a piece of paper. You may leave Richard, thank you. Richard bowed, only leaving Izuku with the enigmatic man sitting in the corner. Well then, I believe it is time for the final portion, always my favorite. The gate master placed his cigar on a desk. He stood up and walked over to the wall covered in weapons. I am certain this is your first time seeing a gun, given the reaction you displayed earlier. However, I take it that you might have some preference. I wouldn't know, Izuku responded silently. No matter, the gate master said. We'll start by looking at the sidearms. 
A voice appeared by the door, the best option for him. Juran leaned across the door, waving the finished glass. The gate master nodded. In that case, we'll start by looking at something more compact. He moved his hand across several pistols before selecting one, he moved forward and brought it to Izuku. This is the HK VP9SK, manufactured and built in Germany. It's a semi-automatic handgun with a 9M caliber. Its design features ambidextrous controls, with 27 customizable grip configurations. It comes in with standard iron sights and a new feature called charging supports. The magazines carry 10 bullets, but we found it able to hold 11. A decent starter gun if you ask me. Izuku stared at it blankly, barely being able to understand the information the man spewed out. Jiren laughed at the situation that unfolded. He picked his way carefully towards them. He'll take that one. We're not the type of people to question your expertise, Jiren said. Very well, said the gate master. Where would you like us to send everything to? The usual? Yes, Jiren told him. However, I ask that you provide triple the amount of ammunition. The gate master nodded, placing the gun back onto the wall. Then I bid to both of you farewell and a good day. As they exited the room, Juren immediately wrapped his arm around Izuku's shoulder. Not bad kid. Let's head back and meet the person who will be training you. Inko sat in her living room, expecting her son to arrive soon. She still did not know how she would handle the situation properly, only playing out the scenarios in her head. A sudden ring from the home telephone caught her off guard. Inko stumbled towards the phone, picking it up with frantic breathing. Hello, this is the Midoriya household, Inko said, holding the phone with both of her hands. I am the vice principal from Aldera Junior High. Am I speaking to MS Inko Midoriya? Inko was not certain why the school called her. Yes, this is... Is everything all right with my son? Miss, that is the reason for our call. Your son Izuku Midoriya was absent from school today. We are calling to confirm with you if he was not present due to an illness or other reason. Izuku left for school this morning, Inko said with a confused look. He should have been at school. Are you sure it's not just a mistake on your end? The phone stayed quiet for a while. It says here he hadn't arrived through the gate this morning, which is confirmed through his homeroom teacher's attendance sheet. We also reviewed them for the other classes, and it plays out the same story. Inko was in shock, she did not know what to do. Since this is his first offense, we only wish to give Izuku a warning. Please let him know that absences without reasoning will not be tolerated. Thank you, have a good day. The phone line died right after. Inko recalled her son's odd behavior earlier in the morning. Izuku, Inko grieved. Tears began to swell in her eyes. What happened? Her body instinctively moved towards her room. She opened her cupboard drawer, revealing the business card of the detective she last met with Izuku the week before. This is where I drop you off, Juren said as the lights began to glow around them. Your new equipment should arrive by the end of the week. I take it I won't have to wait long for my instructor, Izuku asked with just the hint of a smile. Juren placed a hand over the top of his forehead. Listen kid, he said, if I were you, I'd take all the time to relax before he comes. Izuku sat on a small workbench, staring at his feet. He could tell Juren was serious. Is it really that bad? Izuku asked softly. It's worse than whatever you can imagine inside your head, Juren said. If you survive these upcoming months, then I guarantee you'll come out as a completely different person. Izuku had a feeling of what Juren and All for One had decided on for his future in the organization. He wished it had been done with less secrecy. Am I being trained to make up for what I lack with my quirk? He asked. That is correct, Midoriya, Jiren replied. The boss wishes for you to gain experience in actual offensive and defensive combat. And with my suggestion, a few more things are being thrown in there for you to learn. That is why I called him here. His voice echoed through the large room. And one more thing, Jiren stepped over to the exit. Your teacher has a reputation for never having even one of his students stay alive past the second week. Make sure not to disappoint us. Izuku looked at the underground expanse he entered moments earlier. 
It sported state-of-the-art gym equipment, a fitness area with combat dummies, a shooting range, and many other things Izuku had never seen before. He heard the door open once more. A tall figure appeared, wearing a mask that covered the entire face. Izuku attempted to greet the mysterious person, yet he was unable to speak a word. The atmosphere in the room darkened as the man walked closer to Izuku. Is it you? he asked with a chilling voice. Izuku nodded. It was the first time he had felt frightened by someone after the incident with Katsuki. The mask stared at Izuku with silence. What is your quirk? Izuku shared his unease. He did not have the opportunity to figure out everything before. The man in front of him stood impatient, waiting for a response. I don't know much about it myself, but from what I gathered, any injury inflicted towards me from another person is sent to them as well. In that case, we will personally test it now, said the mask. Without pause, he stepped on the boy's shoes. Izuku staggered back, audibly crying out in pain. The man looked at his foot. Indeed, it is as you say, he said. What else do you know? Izuku placed his right leg back on the ground, his foot still throbbed. I don't know. Before he could say anything else, Izuku felt a sharp sting enter his left upper arm. Izuku dropped to his knees, gripping his injured arm with his other hand. Blood began to drip down to the floor, exiting a large wound. The instructor stared at the knife he had thrown towards the boy, taking a mental note of what he had witnessed. All right, that is everything I need to know for now, the man said dryly. The knife was buried deep inside Izuku's flesh, yet no matter how hard he tried to yell out, nothing came out of his mouth. Izuku shifted his head down, his sight grew dimmer as each second passed. Stand up. Izuku could hear the man talking to him, but his mind refused to pay attention. He began to breathe heavily until all of a sudden, he felt his mind and body regain their composure. Izuku opened his eyes to find the man removing the blade out of his arm. The only reason why you are still awake is that I am able to inject adrenaline into your system, the man said, taking out a roll of bandages. This is the one and only time where you get help from me. Whether you die or not during training is none of my concern. I still get paid. Is that clear? Izuku lifted his head, staring at the mask with animosity. Yes, sir, he replied back. Good. You have the mental fortitude, but everything else about you is weak, the masked man pointed out, tossing the bandages to Izuku's side. Cover your wound to stop the bleeding. We will begin training in two minutes. Izuku covered his arm frantically with the covers the man provided him with. Even though his body had been pumped full of adrenaline, the wound still caused immense pain. This resembles more of torture than training, Izuku thought, not knowing if he would make it out alive in the upcoming weeks. Goddamn Jiren wasn't kidding when he said I should have taken my time to relax. He was interrupted once more by the man in the mask. Do you know what I will be attempting to turn you into? He inquired with an almost joyous tone. I am training you to become a cold-blooded assassin, not specifically the ones who kill left and right, blindly following orders they receive. No, you'll be the one that hunts those who kill. He grinned at Izuku. The name is Zero, I look forward to seeing your progress. He threw the knife at Izuku's feet, it was still covered in blood. We will start with a sparring match. Try to kill me using the knife, Zero commanded. Izuku picked up the dagger. He hesitated for a brief second before charging towards his teacher, pointing the edge of the blade towards Zero's chest. Izuku was instantly parried and thrown across the room, hitting the stone wall. The blowback caused Izuku to cough up blood, his arms shook wildly under his weight. Everything in his body hurt. No matter how many times Izuku attempted to hit Zero, he found himself attempting to get back up on his feet. This is no good, Zero barked. He looked at Izuku with disgust. No form at all. You only run towards me while dangling that knife like it's a toy. Zero landed a kick into Izuku's stomach, causing the boy to fall down. Zero grabbed the knife from Izuku's hand before stabbing it into the mat floor. It stood one inch away from his face. The mask moved over to Izuku's ear. This is a weapon. Learn to use it like one. Izuku stood up slowly, taking out the knife from the mat. Zero studied him. 
He noticed that the boy's reaction times were steadily getting faster with each attempt. Your quirk is useless if you cannot attack me or anyone else, so said. You'll only be left as a punching bag. Izuku regained his breathing. You don't have to tell me that, he said after a moment. I know I am weak. Why do you think this is important, Zero asked. He pointed towards Izuku's chest. Because if you train your body to overpower quirks by itself, and you combine it then with your powers, no one will be able to stop you. Both of them faced each other, preparing for another standoff. Only focus on using your body and mind, stressed. He took out a switchblade from his back pocket. This time, I will be attacking back. Izuku gulped. He did not have to imagine what the man would do if he failed to meet his expectations. He took a step forward before slowly circling around Zero, keeping the blade in front of his chest. He's getting down the basics after just an hour of him studying me, so thought. He's a natural learner, but he still does not understand what it means to kill or be killed. He knew that Izuku was instinctively avoiding to fatally harm him. Izuku rushed his right hand forward, slicing downwards onto the stomach. Zu dodged in time, placing one foot back on the floor, kicking Izuku into the chest with his left leg. Izuku's body launched up into the air, his lungs grasped for anything they could find. Zero closed in, slashing Izuku's chest with one clean swipe. You are afraid of killing, Zo growled. That needs to change. He brought down his hand, stabbing Izuku's left leg, twisting the knife inside. Izuku screamed in pain as Zero pressed on harder. Where did all of your spirit go? I asked. He felt his leg burning. You are nothing you understand? He watched as the boy gritted his teeth. Just say that you give up and I'll stop, he said. In his mind, Zero was prepared to kill the boy by throwing the knife if it were to happen. To his surprise, Izuku sent a kick that forced him to let go of the handle. Zero looked at his leg, only to see it bleeding. That is one nasty quirk, he said calmly. Izuku stared at Zero with rage. He left the switchblade protruding out of his leg, preparing for the next round. All right, that is enough sparring for today, Zo said. Izuku refused to stop. He rose his arms up. Zero could see the boy's eyes give off murderous intent. He's in the zone, Zo said to himself. This kid really is something. He's not even afraid after everything I've done to him. Before Izuku could move, he was punched straight into the chest by Zero. He landed on his back, unable to move from the huge strain that was placed on his body. Big eye opener for how much my attacks hurt, said Zero, clutching his own chest. He walked over to Izuku who lay staring at the ceiling, breathing heavily. Finally calmed down. Izuku did not respond, he could not talk even if he wanted to. Zero sat down beside him, looking at the knife he stabbed Izuku earlier with. He intentionally left it there, smart kid. In ten minutes, we'll be moving on to me actually teaching you proper fighting stances and techniques, said. He looked at Izuku before removing the knife from the boy's leg. As for your quirk, you should already know its strengths and weaknesses by now. But I will say it anyway, so pay attention. Any direct physical contact from someone will result in them feeling the exact same pain your body does. This extends to any physical object as well but only if the person is in direct contact with it when it hits you. When I threw the knife at you when we met, I felt nothing. But when I stabbed your leg, I got the same injury. Izuku attempted to laugh, but instead spurted out blood from his mouth. It began to cover his lips until a towel was thrown over his face. Zero looked at Izuku. The torn shirt revealed burns and scars across his entire torso. No wonder why you're so different from the rest, Zen noted. Expect tomorrow to be harder. Izuku could only think of how ridiculous it was for it to only be the first day of training. After everything he experienced with Zero, Izuku had never felt more alive. He moved the towel away from his face. Yes, sir, Izuku muttered, smiling at the man. The sounds of gunshots rattled across the room. Zo watched in silence as Izuku emptied an entire magazine into a target fifty yards away. You've gotten better, but you missed one shot from the heart, Zero pointed out. Six months had passed since he started training Izuku. 
The boy that stood in front of him was no longer the same person he met when he first arrived. Cut off from the outside world, Izuku focused on training day and night. Learning how to expertly shoot guns, fight with a variety of close combat weapons, and how to protect oneself barehanded. Along with other skills that would allow Izuku to stalk and observe targets. Zero knew that his time was running out with the boy, and that there were still many things for Izuku to learn. In the end, it will all come down to getting more experience in real combat, Ze said quietly. Izuku placed his pistol on the table, overhearing his teacher's comment. He turned to face him. Sir, you make it sound as if what you taught me isn't as bad as what's out there. Yes and no, kid. There are many different types of people out there, quirks that might possibly overshadow you, I said. You only get better at fighting that when you do it for real. Izuku looked at Zero, acknowledging his point. He wore a black suit vest the Gate Master's company had made for him. Izuku had begun to wear it two months ago, and it still held up from the bashings he experienced every day. I'm surprised it's held up for so long, Zo said, pointing out Izuku's outfit. The look of a true professional, and yet even its durability surprises me, he said. Where can I get one like that? You would have to speak to Mr. Juran about that, sir. I had no part in making it. Speaking of that man, Zero remembered, he still wore his mask to protect his identity. I've told him your training is complete with what limited time we had. I will be leaving today. Izuku stared at the man who trained him to near-death experiences several times. Even though it was hell to endure everything thrown at him, where at times Izuku wanted to murder that man, he still felt deep respect. Thank you for everything, Zero, Izuku said, letting out a seemingly warm smile. Zero was startled at Izuku calling him by his alias for the first time, but he felt the same. And thank you for the money, Zero replied. As they shook hands, both contemplated how they would kill each other in the near future. Izuku sat on the couch beside the bar. It was the first time he had come back after he had been sent down to train. Kirijiri was seen wiping the already cleaned glasses for the third time. Sometimes I wish we had actual customers, said Kirijiri. The bar is already small in itself. While I haven't seen a human face for half a year, Izuku teased him. Kirijiri placed his hands on the bar counter. Well, in that case, why don't I catch you up on what's going on, he said sincerely. All right, Izuku moved over to the bar seats. He readjusted the tie around his neck. Splendid choice on the outfit. Not many go for that route anymore, said Kirijiri with pleasure. Apart from the suit, I see that your demeanor has changed as well. That tends to happen when you're at death's door every minute, Izuku replied, placing his hands on his lap. Now everything just seems clear to me, but it's difficult to explain. In other words, you've matured, Kirijiri chimed in. It's quite obvious. Well, anyways, glad to have you back. Izuku smirked. Kirijiri had not changed at all since he last saw him. He had wondered what Juren was up to as well, probably smoking a cigarette somewhere. Hey Kirijiri, get me a pint of beer, shouted a voice in the distance. Oh, and look who it is. Izuku turned around to find Muscular approach him. Glad to see you actually alive and well you know here, he said, laughing to himself. I haven't actually thanked you yet for introducing me here, Muscular, Izuku said with a delighted look. He reached out his hand towards him. The pleasure is all mine, Muscular responded, shaking his hand. The force alone almost caused Izuku to fall off his seat. Still writing down quirks and scaring the shit out of people, he asked. Izuku laughed, pausing to look at the wooden pattern on the table. Not as of yet, haven't had the opportunity to. Muscular stared at Izuku, and then to Kirijiri. Haven't you told him what's coming up soon? He asked with a confused expression. Well, I was about to until you came in and took the floor, Kirijiri countered. He placed the glass of beer in front of Muscular. In the next few months, we'll be starting our advance and making a name for ourselves. This caught Izuku's attention. He had always wondered what the League of Villains' major goal was. Just for fame? He asked Kirijiri. Not fully, but it's more about showing the world that the society of heroes is that of a broken system. It means we get to kill people, 
Muscular said with excitement, almost anyone we want. Izuku stayed quiet, there were definitely people he knew deserved what was coming for them, but he also did not want to involve innocent people getting mixed inside the crossfire. It's heroes that act for their self-interests that I want to deal with personally, he thought. The bar phone rang. Kirjiri walked over and picked it up, listening for a few seconds before closing the line. The master wishes to speak with you as soon as possible, Midoriya. Same room as last time, if you remember. This excited Izuku. He had been preparing to do something meaningful ever since he had joined. It was his chance to make a good first impression on the man who had given him his quirk. Izuku stood up and walked over to the door, waving goodbye to the bar. Inside stood a desk with a television monitor that was turned on. In the background Izuku could make out a figure that was sitting in a giant chair, waiting for him. Welcome, welcome Izuku Midoriya, it said. It has truly been a while since we last spoke. Please, take a seat. All for one, was there a reason for calling me? Izuku asked impatiently, barely holding in his enthusiasm. There is always a reason if I am involved, all for one stated. I see that you have completed your assimilation into the League. And so, I am here to inform you of two tasks I wish you to complete. One is short term, and the other one a bit more complicated. Of course, what would you like me to do? Izuku asked. All for one moved his hands across the screen. For the first task, you and Toga Himiko will be subduing and eliminating two heroes, that of which I will provide you with the names for tomorrow. The other I will explain to you in more detail once you return, but know that it will be an infiltration mission that only you can pull off. That is all. You may rest for tonight, all for one advised. I will send Kirajiri all of the details you will need for the job. Understood, Izuku responded immediately.